Okay, check one, two, check one, two, testing, testing. Uh, should be live. Please comment in the chat uh, if you can hear me and uh, please hit the like button to help fuel the algorithm. Never had a spell, never know how to spell an algorithm. There you go. Uh, please also comment any questions that you have in the chat. Uh, what's up, uh, Torin? How's it going, man? Um, but uh, it should be a good stream uh, this, uh, t this weekend, today. I hope you are having a good weekend. It is coming to a close, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, hope it was a good one. And uh, I was pretty conflicted on which topic to stream about today. I actually had two that I wanted to um, discuss, but I'm saving one. Well, maybe, probably three. I was either going to do an open session uh, uh, or I was going to discuss the movie Barbie that just came out, uh, or I was going to uh, talk about this stream uh, that uh, Sean Carroll put out. But uh, we will talk about uh, the Barbie movie at some point because it is, I will admit, absolutely fascinating. I did go and see it with my wife, and it is probably the most interesting commentary on modern gender dynamics I've ever seen on in film, ever. And uh, it's nothing like what anybody is making it out to be. It just is what it is. I don't even feel like it really makes a, an overt statement about anything other than this is kind of where we're at. And uh, I thought it was actually like better than expected. I wasn't looking forward to seeing it, to be quite honest. I was going uh, just because my wife wanted to see it. And um, I ended up laughing quite a bit uh, throughout the movie and uh, also just being fascinated by the amount of conscious and unconscious themes regarding our modern gender dynamics that have been woven into the, the film. It doesn't shy away from the fact that it is absolutely just, a, it is a commentary on modern gender dynamics. That's what it is. It's, it's, that's not a hidden thing. It's, it's a very intentional thing. It's not a kid's movie at all, um, but it's not really raunchy in, uh, or anything like that. And, or, or in a, that inappropriate. I mean, every movie these days is basically inappropriate. Um, but in comparison to other things, uh, you know, Oppenheimer is much more, you know, graphic and um, I guess sexually inappropriate. But uh, um, another great movie, though. Highly recommend that you see that one as well. But um, but this it wasn't as interesting, odd, oddly enough, as uh, as the Barbie movie. But uh, we will do a stream on it eventually. Uh, I need to organize my thoughts on it, but it was good, I will admit. I think there's a lot that we can dive into in that, in that movie, talking about gender. But uh, today we're gonna focus on physics, which, you know, how different is that really? But uh, we'll get into that a bit later. Uh, and the reason why um, uh, Sean Carroll probably put this out is and it's very long it's the the link below uh there is a link below to sean carroll's uh live stream or or uh podcast recording that he did it's just himself uh talking about the alleged crisis in physics and uh he discusses whether or not there is a crisis in physics he discusses what uh the crisis might be and why others might be stating that there's a crisis in physics even if there's not a crisis in physics and uh, I would assume that this is mostly in response to a lot of what Eric Weinstein has been saying, or at least the conversations that he has been starting uh, regarding there being a crisis in physics. But it's not just Eric Weinstein, but uh, he's definitely the loudest voice in who's stating that physics is in a crisis. But there's many people who are stating that physics is in a crisis. I state that physics is in a crisis. Plenty of people who... W who believe in more, taking a more idealism type of stance 
would probably say that physics is in a crisis. Uh, you know, Bernardo Kastrup would probably say this as well. So um, it's not a, an uncommon phrase these days, uh, but uh, like I said, Eric Weinstein's definitely the loudest voice. And um, uh, I would assume that this is in response mainly to him, but maybe not entirely. Uh, Sean Carroll is somebody, if you don't know, uh, who I have ex quite a bit of fundamental differences with. I mean, maybe, I don't know if quite a bit is a good term, but a few select very fundamental differences with when it uh, comes to just uh, thinking about physics. And it leads to very different conclusions uh, on cosmology and things like that. He is an anti-theist, um, and I've given a talk on here before uh, where we discussed his lecture uh, that's called God is Not a Good Theory, and I um, uh, have given my thoughts on it, and, and I made a funny clip about it that maybe we'll look at at some point that uh, he is not a fan of, and I actually will say I like Sean Carroll uh, in, in, you know, plenty of ways. Uh, I don't know him personally, but he is one of the people that inspired me to start, the, not to start this project, but to continue down this project. Uh, when he went on Joe Rogan many years ago, he talked about how there was so much room for philosophers to add to the physics discussion. And I'm not a physicist by training um, and, or by accreditation, and I'm not even a, an accredited philosopher, but do you really need a PhD in philosophy to be a philosopher? I would say absolutely not. Um, I don't think you need a PhD in anything to be anything, but just for the sake of not seeming disingenuous, I try not to call myself, you know, a theoretical physicist or something like that. I'll say a physics theorist because it's a little different, but it, and it's true, but it's not, uh, you know, it doesn't, part of communication is uh, to communicate what you are trying to communicate. Uh, and I don't think that calling myself a theoretical physicist would communicate to others what I'm thinking about when I say it, even if it's technically true. But um, uh, but he, I, I do, you know, take him, I don't know what, if it's a more philosophical approach is even the right word, wording to describe it, but it is a less mathematically rigorous and and uh, practiced approach when it comes to uh, physics at this point you know i'm trying to learn a bit but uh and that you could describe as a philosophical approach but i think that physics theoretical physics and and theoretical anything of any field is basically philosophy and uh it's you practicing philosophy so um but Sean Carroll said that on Joe Rogan, that philosophers had uh, could add a lot to physics discussions. And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to uh, continue down this road, though, a bit. Uh, it wasn't that I was not going to do it without him saying that, but I did. It was inspiring. I will admit it was inspiring. And I, w when I decided to learn a lot more about uh, physics, when I realized that my models of mind were lining up with some... Uh, some concepts and, and observations and models in physics, I turned to Sean Carroll's uh, Biggest Ideas in the Universe um, and, and um, you know, lectures on his, pot, on his YouTube channel to learn about physics. So uh, while I have my differences, uh, uh, I also have quite a bit of respect for Sean Carroll and I think he has a lot to add. And if you want to learn more about physics as it is currently, you know, figured to be, I would highly recommend Sean Carroll's channel, probably more than anyone else's that I've uh, found so far. But uh, just as it's a teaching channel, he is a natural teacher. That is definitely true. But uh, he did unfortunately block me on Twitter. And if he ever watches this, I, I hope that you would unblock me one day. That would be nice. Uh, and um, the, I didn't do anything rude. I just said once that uh, he, had, he had put out a statement saying that you shouldn't trust any theory revealed on a podcast after Eric Weinstein uh, had, you know, presented it, well, not presented, but 
but um, uh, I guess unveiled, I don't know if that's the right word, but um, uh, his theory, geometric unity, uh, on Joe Rogan's uh, podcast, and or at least that he was working on it. And Sean Carroll said something about not putting your theories out on podcasts or that you shouldn't trust them as much. It's not, you know, academically rigorous. And I just commented back that, you know, you get on podcasts and talk about your theories all the time. What's the difference? And that's all I said. And, um, but he was probably getting bombarded with quite a bit of other ruder comments and just was blocking everybody. But if he ever sees this, I would really appreciate you unblocking me. Um, I would, you know, he's even invited onto the show if he ever wants to come on. But, um, so he put out this, uh, this, stream called the crisis in physics it's just him speaking for four and a half hours it is very long and uh, i would say that about half of it is just going through what we know or what we think we know currently about physics and uh and it's a very good uh you know um i guess stream i mean it, there's he's not his face isn't in it so it's like i don't know if it's called the stream but it's a very good podcast episode and it's worth it if you really are into physics uh, to watch the entire thing. It is linked below. And um, if you are not into physics enough to listen for four and a half hours, then you can listen to the clips that we're going to go through. But uh, like I said, please hit the like button. It helps fuel the algorithm. Comment any questions you have in the chat. I will try and get to them. If you really want me to get to them, you can post a super chat. Uh, I have, tr I think I turned on uh, super chats. And uh, I really appreciate any uh, support, whether it is financial or it is just act engagement, um, in the form of engagement, it is, uh, very, very helpful. So, and appreciated. So with that, um, let's see here. Sounds interesting. I haven't seen it, but heard several synopses and reviews. There is a crisis in epistemology. Modern physics is bankrupt. I was saying at first, screw what Weinstein says. Um, Jai Mungle and Goldstein, uh, cage match. Why would I fight Kurt Jai Mungle? I'm a fan of Kurt Jai Mungle. I'm a, Kurt. I would describe Kurt as a friend of mine. I would not uh, fight Kurt. Um, Carol is the least obnoxious scientist. I have theoretical degree in physics. Okay, Carol versus Weinstein fight card. That would be uh, better. <laughs> uh, academia is a flop though standard model is bankrupt it's not bankrupt uh, but it does need there's more that needs to be understood about it and I'm not saying that I understand it all uh, about what needs to be done but I suspect there's something going on with the Higgs boson that is not we, we, we there's things that we don't understand that's all I'm saying but uh, so first clip we will talk about why I think physics is definitely in a crisis but and why this crisis is comes from uh something that uh is um it, it is pervaded every single um bit of physics but i think it's the lack of theism but we will get to that so this is uh this clip is Sean Carroll talking about how cosmologists need to be careful about hand wavy models, which um, I understand why he would say that, but we'll talk about it. Data that we have so far collected, we can hope, and in some cases it's clearly true, that there will be deviations in their predictions down the line, but so far in the data we've actually made, these theories make the same predictions. So that's a weak understanding. We, we kind of have theories that might be right, but we don't know if any one of, of them is right, or we don't know which one is right, or even if the one that will turn out to be right is one that we haven't invented yet. And that's also true not just for quantum mechanics, but for other famous examples like in cosmology. Dark matter, dark energy, these are things that cosmologists talk about all the time. And you have to be a little bit careful when you talk about how well we understand these things. It is too easy to say, well, 95% of the universe is something we don't understand at all. That's just wrong. That, that's not something that you should say. 90% of the universe, which is the 70% that is dark energy, 25% that is dark matter, are things that we haven't pinpointed yet. 
But that is very, very different from saying that we don't understand them at all. On the one hand, we know an enormous amount about their properties. We know how much dark matter and dark energy there is. We know where it is. We know how it behaves to a very good approximation. And we have multiple theories that could account for what is going on in both cases. For dark matter, we have WIMPs and axions and plenty of other ideas. For dark energy, we have the vacuum energy, the cosmological, con uh, the cosmological constant, which is the same as the vacuum energy, also dynamical quintessence-like fields and so forth. But we don't know which, if any of those, are right. So I would qualify that as a weak kind of understanding. There's something that we understand about the phenomenon. We have more than one theory that can fit the data, but we have not yet figured out which, if any, of those theories is right. And then there are cases where there's no understanding, so neither strong nor weak understanding, right? Uh, we don't have any solid theories that account for the data. A classic example right now in modern physics would be what happened at the Big Bang. We just don't know. What happened before the Big Bang? Is there even before a Big Bang? We just don't know. We have to be honest. We have kind of hand-wavy models. Again, I'm responsible for some of them, but we don't have anything that rises to the level of a completely convincing theory that, you know, if we discovered a wimp or an axion tomorrow, you go, oh yeah, okay, good. That's the answer. We've been waiting to figure it out. Now we know it. There's no such theory on the market now, which even if we found evidence for it, when it comes to what happened at the Big Bang, we would instantly jump on that bandwagon because the theories are half-baked. They're in the situation where maybe quantum mechanics was in 1925 or something like that. And the history is that most of the time in the history of physics, there were big, obvious things you could point to where we had no understanding. Things that were very well within the realm of experimentally accessible phenomena. You know, today we say the Big Bang is something about which we have no understanding, but you can't see the Big Bang either, right? It's a very long time ago. <laughs> and more importantly, there is the, when I talk about the Big Bang now, I mean literally the moment, okay? Not the Big Bang model. The Big Bang model is what happens over the next 14 billion years as the universe expands and cools from an initially hot, dense state and galaxies coalesce. All of that is the Big Bang model. That's in 100% good shape. What happened at the moment of the Big Bang is something we have no understanding about. But it is precisely because of features right after the purported initial moment that kind of make it hard to see what happened at that moment. The universe basically is, is locally in thermal equilibrium. It's not really in thermal equilibrium because the universe is expanding, but the hot, dense plasma is, you know, kind of featureless. There's not a lot there. There's a little bit there, of course. We look at... Okay, so... Uh, he's right about a lot of things that he said there, and um, uh, I, you know, I agree. There's nothing really to disagree with. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to say that. There isn't much to disagree with about what he said there regarding how cosmologists need to be careful about uh, how they discuss things, because sometimes they say things that uh, make it sound like we have no understanding of something, but in reality there is, you know, quite a bit of data at least available regarding a specific phenomenon on the other hand they will say things all the time that are totally just you know theories with basically zero evidence okay <laughs> and um uh, about the multiverse and many worlds and things like that and uh and that is uh stated though as as basically science. And uh, I'm not going to say that it's not, uh, but a lot of people would say that other things are not science. They'll be like, the theology is not science. Theism is not science. Because there's no direct evidence, they say. I disagree with this, actually, but uh, for the, you know, uh, a supreme sentient being. But uh, that, even if that were true, that there is, you know, a lack of evidence around us, which I don't think that there's any lack of evidence, actually, that's the problem, is that there's constant evidence, and that's why we miss it. Um, you know, it's the fish looking for water. Uh, uh, but uh, even if that wasn't the case, then this, the, the, the idea of the multiverse or something is not that different from would not be that different from theism. And uh, I think it is actually quite a bit different, but I, I, you know, sentient singularity theory implies that there are multiple verses, as I call them. One comes from the next. It's basically a chain of verses, which is the universe going through a process, um, uh, each verse of the evolution of life and, uh, or of mind within it. And, uh, and so it goes through this process and then it reaches an endpoint and then it repeats uh, or it makes another one within itself. So it's basically this like chain of nested Matryoshka dolls uh, that is, you know, what I call cosmological verses or uh, you could call it a multiverse chain. But uh, 
it's it is a chain though that is another that is something important to recognize about the structure of it in sentient singularity theory is that it is a chain of nested verses it's not a bunch of uh at least not right now it doesn't seem to be uh as logical for there to be just a bunch of you know universes um or a bunch of verses that are not a chain uh, a lineage chain but uh that uh the, the whole, that conversation gets a little blurry. You have to define some terms because what is a, is the universe all verses in the multiverse, or is the universe or is each verse in a multiverse a universe? It's just like a matter of def, defining, and it could be either one. It's just you have to just pick one. Um, but uh, so, but Sean Carroll he puts forth his theory of many worlds and um, uh, and. Uh, that is one of those models that there's there's like no evidence I don't think for it uh, and I think that it arises from as a consequence of trying to avoid the theistic implications um, but uh, it's I mean it, that's pretty clear but it, it is uh, you know nonetheless like it is a proposed idea but um, yeah I mean it, it's it's tough you have to I don't think physicists know how to talk about any of this stuff these days. I mean, you listen to Michio Kaku and Eric Weinstein says, you know, every now and then he's like, Michio Kaku's out of control. And it just it just makes me laugh every time I hear it because you just look at Michio Kaku and you're like, how could that guy be out of control? But I actually do agree with him on in to some extent. Uh, I understand what he's getting at and, and he's right. Um, there's so much just statements made uh, by physics communicators who might also be theoretical physicists, but they're also physics communicators and, um, uh, and they're stated as such, uh, um, so assertively, I guess, when they said, when, you know, Michio Kaku says things like, well, now we know that there's 11 dimensions and it's like, yeah, you do you know what that means? I don't even think you know what that means, and I I, I don't think that they know what that means. So uh, there's a lot of things that are just stated, you know, on podcasts and uh, communicated to the public as if we know them, and uh, and we don't um, at all. And we and the, it's not even that we don't know them; it's that we don't even know what they mean. That's like the crisis in physics that uh, we will get to in a bit, but. Um, uh, this, I do think, is a consequence of a crisis in physics where there is this phenomenon where uh, things are stated as if they are understood to be true and they're not even understood conceptually, which is, I mean, it's like a, a lack of, a meta lack of understanding. It's like another level of lack of understanding. But it's, it's a lack of, a lack of understanding a lack of awareness of your lack of understanding. That's what the problem is. But that's the problem in every field right now. And I would say that it has to do with all, almost the It's all coming from the same, basically like two main causes. And uh, we'll get to them. But uh, so this next, um, this next clip is uh, him talking about um, how we, well, I mean, I, it doesn't even, we don't even need to look at the clip, but I'll just explain it. But he basically states, it goes on multiple times to state that th there is no cabal or conspiracy or closed mindedness that is causing um, this current state of physics where there are, you know, some exclusivity of ideas and things like that. And, and any crisis that could be going on is not due to a cabal or conspiracy or closed-mindedness. I would say that um, you don't know if that's true, but I, you know, that's for probably another stream. But it's, it's, it is all of those things. The closed-mindedness one is definitely true, and um, and it might be some type of intentional effort that has been put into stifling our physics uh, by humans or not. Um, you know, humans. And uh, we've talked about that before, but it does appear like there was some weird uh, uh, lack of, of 
of advancement that we would have expected because of the advancement of technology is usually a exponential uh, curve, but uh, and understanding is usually an exponential curve. But it's not always. Sometimes you go through a dark ages, basically. And I do think that we have been essentially in kind of a dark ages for physics. It's just a matter of what is the cause of it. And uh, closed mindedness is definitely part of it. The way that it's taught is def and and then the way that it is that accreditations are handled is definitely part of that. Um, and that's this is not just field specific to physics. It's like I said, it's everywhere. And then I would say that uh, anti-theism as the prevailing uh, worldview is also very much part of the lack of uh, advancement in physics. But. This is him talking about dark matter. And uh, I thought this was interesting because years ago, when I first started this project, uh, before it was, I, it was called sentient singularity theory, before it had a name, before I had any really physics aspirations, but I saw some things that could be true in physics and just like models in my, that I, I had had kind of, I just visualized how some things could possibly uh, answer questions that we have in physics, including one regarding dark matter. And uh, I had not studied it enough really to know whether or not there was anything that was similar to my thoughts on it, but I was not, I had not actually um, heard anybody say anything similar and I didn't expect to because my thoughts are in the context of a theistic uh, worldview it is and uh, that basically uh, that dark matter wasn't due to and it's this is complicated because sentient singularity theory has an experiment that I am pr going to propose uh, uh, pretty soon I've been working on it a bit and it's going to take time even after I uh, talk about it more publicly to figure out the details but it has to do with um, you know, where does gravity come from? And, uh, and that I, I don't think that gravity comes from matter. I think that we observe a gravitational effect around matter uh, often, but it's not coming from the matter uh, itself, not, not entirely, at least. And, uh, and this kind of idea could suggest that dark matter is not coming from any hidden particles that might exist, uh, but they are, it, it, it's just this excess gravity that we perceive in the universe is coming from the universe itself as a whole, um, uh, as an agent, you know, that is, that is acting on, uh, with, you know, with, and animating things in the universe instead of it just being a consequence of matter. And uh, he talks a bit about uh, a similar-ish idea on here, it seems. So here we go. Carefully about dark matter, because it gets a certain reputation that I think, you know, you, you want to think clearly about the dark matter. So the first thing to realize about the dark matter is it exists. <laughs> we, we have enough data, enough information to say that dark matter is real, OK? That doesn't mean that gravity is not also doing something weird in cosmology. So those of you, I know that there's probably a heterogeneous audience out here. Some of you are hearing some of these vocabulary words for the first time. Others have been hearing far too much about it. But there is the following very, very natural line of thought. How do we know there's dark matter? Well, you know, we look at some astrophysical thing like a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies. We know how gravity works, right? It's a fact of gravity in the observable universe that actually Newtonian gravity works pretty well. You know, Newtonian gravity fails when gravity becomes very, very strong, like near a black hole or something like that. It also fails if you want to have a source of gravity that is relativistic, like photons or whatever. But in the world around us, if you stay away from the black holes at centers of galaxies, for galaxies and for clusters and stuff like that, Newton's approximation works very well for figuring out what the gravitational field actually is. And in Newtonian gravity, there's a very direct correlation 
between how much stuff you have, how much matter you have, and how strong the gravitational field is. So you can implicitly work out, for example, the mass of the sun by just seeing how the planets orbit around the sun, figuring out their gravitational force that makes that happen, and inferring the mass of the sun. So you can also play that same game for galaxies and clusters. And what you find is the gravitational field necessary to account for the motions that you see in galaxies and clusters is substantially larger than the amount of stuff that you can actually discern, the amount of ordinary matter. So you have to be careful about that. I mean, obviously, maybe you just missed some ordinary matter. Like, maybe it's invisible. Maybe it's just not glowing at the wavelengths you like. And in fact, if you just counted stars, you would be well undercounting the total mass of galaxies and clusters. Most of the mass in a cluster, for example, the ordinary mass is in hot intergalactic gas. That is, uh, turns out you can see it if you look in the x-rays because it's hot. So it's giving off x-rays, you can actually find it nowadays, but in the 1970s, you couldn't find it. So because the gravitational field is larger than what you see, um, and, and by the way, again, I should, I should be very, very clear because it is worth getting this right. We have separate, completely independent ways of figuring out how much ordinary matter there is in the universe. We have that both from the cosmic microwave background, which implicitly has its patterns of temperature fluctuations depend on the amount of ordinary matter, and also from primordial nucleosynthesis. The early universe was a nuclear reactor. It was fusing protons and neutrons into helium and lithium and deuterium in a way that depends on how much ordinary matter there is. So all of these lines of evidence, direct inventories, the cosmic microwave background, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, they give us the same answer. They all agree 5% of the matter density of the energy density of the universe is in ordinary matter. So the idea that there's just more, you know, brown dwarfs or planets out there or so forth, that's not going to fly for the whole dark matter issue. So where is this extra gravity coming from that we appear to get in galaxies and clusters? The obvious simple answer is maybe there's more matter than you see. So it's not ordinary matter, maybe it's extraordinary matter, which we call dark matter, something that has to be a different kind of particle, not in the standard model. But there's another very obvious thing to think, which is that all of our reason for believing in dark matter comes not from directly detecting it, not from putting our fingers on it and touching it directly, but from seeing its gravitational influence, right? So of course, it's possible that what we're seeing is not that there's new matter, but that gravity is different on these cosmological scales than it is, let's say, here in the solar system, a theory of modified gravity. That is 100% a sensible thing to think about. So let me be very clear, there's no sense whatsoever in which the establishment is keeping people from thinking about modified gravity. Everyone in the establishment has thought about modified gravity. I've thought about it, my most highly cited paper is on the idea of modified gravity. But nevertheless, the data have spoken. Gravity might very well be modified, but dark matter is still there. So let me be very clear about why that's true, because it's important for this. And let me first say before why the data have spoken, Let's see what the theory has to say, right? We talked before about effective field theories. Um, gravity is a field theory. Gravity is an effective field theory. The low energy limit of general relativity is the right theory to use when describing these galaxies and clusters and so forth. And Ken Wilson taught us how to think about these effective field theories. And part of his uh, catechism is that it is perfectly natural for the field theory that you know and love to change and be modified at small distances and high energies. It is not at all natural for a quantum field theory to change and be modified at long distances and low energies. It is hard to hide new effects that would be important at very, very large length scales and not at medium light scales. So it is very hard to come up with new effects that will be relevant for galaxies, but invisible in the solar system. Now, just because it's hard, it doesn't mean you can't do it. That's why people try to do it. That is why people like me have written down theories and they go to great lengths to say, well, okay, why haven't we actually seen these effects here in the solar system, etc.? I'm just trying to let you know that in case you're saying, well, if we've only tested general relativity really well in like, you know, pulsars and the solar system or whatever, why shouldn't it be different in galaxies and clusters? And there's an answer to that because effective field theory says it won't be. Again, it's easy to imagine changing it in galaxies and clusters, but very hard to imagine ways of changing it that don't show up in other experiments. You have to work to do that. You can, but you have to work to do it. So theoretic. Okay, so basically he's, he's just stating, and I don't know all the different modified gravity theories out there, um, and any of them that are not in that, or that are not 
due to, you, you know, the assertion that we're inside a sentient being and that this is, you know, the movement of a, of a being uh, is, uh, is not the same as mine. But um, that, and I don't expect that to be a common idea because theism is not a common uh, worldview in the uh, quote unquote, you know, hard sciences. But uh, it was good to hear that there is actually, you know, people thinking about how this might not be due to matter. It might be due to, to gravity and um, that it's gr we're seeing excess gravity because of uh, something going on beyond just the amount of stuff that we have present uh, to, you know, warp space time, as is the current uh, understanding of of gravity but or it's the current it, it's at least the current effective theory model but it is uh it was good to hear that but i don't know what his um theory of modified gravity is but i'm sure it's not the same as mine because he's not a theist but anyways okay this next part is about um uh philosophers and physicists, basically. Theory, and the third is quantum gravity, which I'm sure you've heard about. So let's talk about the naturalness problems. The naturalness problems in the core theory come about because we have this idea, and it's not a very philosophically respectable idea. I think it, I think there is a philosophically respectable idea buried in there, but I think that the philosophers and the physicists have not really sat down to hash out what it should be. But the germ of the idea is, some features of a theory like the core theory look natural to us, some features do not. What does it mean for a feature to look natural to us? And Gerard de Tuft, who's a famous physicist, uh, one of the great masters of quantum field theory in the 70s and 80s and so forth, put forward uh, a certain definition of naturalness in the context of quantum field theory having to do with the existence of a small parameter is natural if a symmetry is restored when that small parameter is literally zero. But there's other notions of naturalness that we use at a more informal level, and we can talk about like, why should we have some expectation that something is natural? The rough and ready thing that we have in mind when we say that things in the standard model are natural or not is if you have a dimensionless number, so not like a mass or something like that, but maybe a ratio of two masses, that's a dimensionless number. If you have a dimensionless number that is very, very tiny, much, much smaller than one, or contrary-wise, its reciprocal is way, way greater than one, okay? If you find such a number for no good reason, like it's the combination of a whole bunch of things that really should add up, we think, to something of order unity, but it doesn't. That's a naturalness problem. That, that's something that looks wrong to us. And I already mentioned the strong CP problem. That's one of the naturalness problems. There's two other big famous ones in the core theory. One is the hierarchy problem, and that's the ratio of the scale of the electroweak interactions, which is of order couple hundred GeV, GeV is a billion electron volts, to the Planck scale, or to, if you think that there's some unification scale up there near the Planck scale, then same thing. So very roughly speaking, the weak scale divided by the Planck scale in the real world is something like 10 to the minus 15, okay? That's a tiny number. And the reason why there's some meat on these bones is because if you think of the electroweak scale in the context of quantum field theory, it looks like it is a combination of various different contributions from various different things, okay? There are quantum corrections. If you start with a classical theory, there's quantum corrections to that classical result. You should add them all together, etc. And there's no reason for them to cancel, and they're generally big. So very roughly speaking, we would expect the quantum corrections that we know and love from the standard model of particle physics would increase the electroweak scale if you just started with some classical value, and it would increase it all the way up to the Planck scale. There's no reason for it not to but it doesn't, it's 10 to the minus 15 times the Planck scale, rough, very, very roughly speaking. That's the hierarchy problem. Why is there such a large hierarchy between the electroweak scale and Planck scale? The other problem is of course the cosmological constant problem. It's almost exactly the same story. The vacuum energy, the cosmological constant could very well be thought of as getting, com getting contributions from various different sources, classical, quantum, etc., and it should be up there near the Planck scale. It is not. Depending on how you use units to measure it in, if you use units of energy density, the energy density in the vacuum is 10 to the minus 120 times the Planck scale value. Now, that's the famous number that is supposed to be the largest discrepancy between expectation and reality in all of physics. 
I think it's perfectly valid to take the one quarter power of that. that. Take 10 to the minus 120, raise it to the power one over four. Why? Because dimensionally, this energy density that you're looking at has units of energy to the fourth power. Once you go into natural units when h bar equals c equals one, that's what particle physicists do. Everything is measured in energy to some power. Energy density is energy to the fourth power. So the actual discrepancy in energy scale between the vacuum energy and the Planck scale is not 10 to the minus 120, but 10 to the minus 30, okay? 10 to the minus 30 is still a really small number. This is a giant discrepancy between um, what we see and what we might expect. Now, in the case of the hierarchy problem, the thing is that the electroweak scale is has been historically a little bit high for us to look at directly. That was the motivation behind building the Large Hadron Collider, would have been the motivation behind building the Superconducting Super Collider, which, remember, would have gotten to even higher energies than the LHC would have. But we canceled it because in the late 1990s, we were on a, a drive to cut the budget deficit. So the SSC was started but never finished, and the tunnel was basically filled in. We're never going to do that. So the LHC, Large Hadron Collider at CERN outside Geneva, is our best look near the electroweak scale. And because of the hierarchy problem, um, there was this very, very strong expectation that once we actually looked at the physics of the electroweak scale, we would find some kind of new physics. There are specific examples of what it could be, supersymmetry or extra dimensions or whatever, strong dynamics, there's various different options on the table, but there was a strong feeling that because of the hierarchy problem, there had to be something going on at the electroweak scale, and whatever that something was would give rise to a whole bunch of new particles, okay? Maybe they'd be supersymmetric particles. Supersymmetry, if you know, is a hypothetical symmetry between bosons and fermions. From the mathematical quantum field theory perspective, it's an extremely natural thing to think about supersymmetry. And it turns out to have all sorts of nice properties. It helps make calculations easier. You know, it, it uh, has very, very specific predictions experimentally and so forth. And it could help solve the hierarchy problem. And it could give us a dark matter candidate. The neutralino would be a supersymmetric particle that would be a candidate to be a WIMP, to be a weakly interacting massive particle. So it seemed, if you're thinking, you know, 20 years ago, again, you would have absolutely every right to think that by now we would have both found the dark matter in direct searches for dark matter, the weakly interacting massive neutralino, and we would have found a whole bunch of new particles at the LHC because the LHC looks at the electroweak scale, found the Higgs boson, right, and is looking for more particles out there. Didn't work. Didn't happen. We have not found any new particles. We, it could have been the case that we turn on the LHC and gluinos are just popping out of the detector, <laughs> and so many of them that it's hard to miss them, right? Uh, we haven't seen any, not just supersymmetric particles, but any particles beyond what are already in the core theory. Now, uh, to be honest, we're not done yet. We're nowhere near done. The LHC is still running, still looking for new things, always creeping. Okay, so basically, I'm not a, um, I'm not the most caught up on everything that he's talking about there, to be quite honest. Uh, I'm not... Uh, somebody who has a academic training in this, but, um, and I understand some of what he's getting at, but not all of it. And, um, but what I will say is that in general, what, when you have some type of uh, problem that, or, or uh, expectation for some value that you expect to show up in a certain place, uh, then when it doesn't and something totally weird and, and unnatural seems to show up, uh, it's usually because from what I, my own experience with my own work, you're looking, you're asking the wrong question regarding what you're actually seeking to, to see. And, um, and it's because you've missed some symmetry structure that you Took, that caused you to take a wrong turn or, or not take the right turn when you needed to. And, um, uh, and that's probably something that physicists run into all the time and don't know it or do know it. And, uh, and you know, it just depends on who uh, runs into the problem. But uh, I, I just thought it was interesting um, for him to kind of get it uh, at this idea that, that, um, you know, we need this interaction between philosophers and physicists um, in order to um, kind of solve these these problems that are the the naturalist problems uh, in physics or or similar problems uh, because 
you need someone who is beyond the the constraints of the specific subfield that we are currently operating in in the academic sphere so you might need someone who is going to look take a more holistic look at the world on you know molecular and biological levels cellular levels even who knows civilizational levels uh lineage levels all kinds of different ways of looking at the symmetries of of the cosmos and if you are only looking for them in a specific field maybe the symmetries that you are expecting are not actually between that field and itself and or structures within that specific level of of uh of focus i guess but they are actually between levels so there there are symmetry structures that extend beyond physics that move their way up into biology and even into uh you know government and uh, uh and market levels and one of those is gender like i've said before and you know i was taking a look at um uh the standard model pretty uh the other day and i i just stared at it sometimes and i like mess with it in excel and um uh here i can actually pull it up but um i was just messing with this and and looking at it and trying to figure out any kind of symmetries that i find and whatever and i do this every now and then and um i you know put in certain values that i kind of might expect somewhere but then aren't and then um uh but or that maybe i don't know but the 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 point is is that there are it's pretty clear to me when you look at this that there is a there is a gendered symmetry to the standard model and that gendered symmetry up, scales upwards uh you know into uh the levels above it uh, above uh physics into you know organisms and and even above that so uh and we've talked about that before uh, on here but um it's just an example of what i'm you know of a of a, of a symmetry of, uh, that transcends levels of scale i guess i don't like the word scale to be quite honest but um or or it transcends the loop spaces of uh, is a better way of putting it or the um uh, the periodicity um, the levels of the periodicity of sentience, of matter, of life, growth, whatever you want to call it, the cosmos. And, uh, but, and physicists, whether they tr would, you know, whether they know it or not, and some of them do know it, and some of them don't know it, and some of them know how to escape it, maybe, or they have ways where they think they know how, and maybe it's correct, and some of them do not, uh, are still stuck in relativity and eric weinstein talks about this a lot and um he talks about how uh basically we created like a prison for our own minds with relativity with the idea of relativity even though it is not a false idea it's not it's not going to allow you to see um the the uh, the super true lines of uh the you know co cosmological manifold like you're not going to see the differentiation in uh structures that you would that you need to see in order to tr transcend uh into understanding a more fundamental um st st structure of existence as opposed to looking at stars and galaxies and temperature and space and distance and 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 time and all these things that are not um they're not fundamental so when you're trying to look at certain ratios and things like that uh, and you're looking for specific ratios and you're expecting them to be a certain way but then they're not uh, it's usually because uh, it, at least from my own work that i've seen when i'm looking at ratios and uh in my work the it's because there's some type of um you're 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 not looking at them from the right perspective that's all i'm gonna say and you need philosophers 
to expand out the uh, field of view that, uh, that you have access to in order to start looking for these symmetry structures. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, that is not something that physicists are good at these days because of hyper-specialization. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, physics is in a crisis. And, but it's not just physics, it's every field. It is because our education system, by its very nature, and there's no way to teach out of this. There is not. I do not believe there is, at least. There is a way to learn out of this, but there isn't a way to teach out of this. And that's those are two very different things, uh, is that we, are, we have these fields that are hyper-specialized, and they are giving out certificates of competency or certifications to people in specific fields. And then that is assumed to be... Uh, you know, documentation as to your understanding of 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 the field, and and we've reached a point though in every field I think uh, where we've kind of hit the walls between them, and in order to bust down the walls between biology and physics, and between um, you know theology and biology, and uh, computer science, and and uh, you know. Uh, ecology, I mean, whatever it is, chemistry, you're going to need philosophers who aren't restricted to only focusing on their own specific little sliver of, of, uh, of the cosmos, because that is what they've been taught. And, uh, and that is part of why every field is in a crisis, because in order to advance all of these fields, at this point, everything from, and we talked about Barbie at the beginning of this stream about how I want to do a stream about it at some point because it was, it's a fascinating commentary on modern gender dynamics. Um, everything from physics to gender is connected. And I know that sounds cliche when everybody's like, oh, it's all connected. But it really is. It, it must be. It logically must be connected. That doesn't mean everything is directly connected. It can be indirectly connected. And some things are directly connected. But everything is connected. And so um, there, this means that if there, in order to understand biology better, maybe it requires... And not just understand biology better, but to have like a revolution in the understanding of, of biological structures uh, and, and organisms and cells and things like that. Um, or to have a revolution in physics again. It's going to take maybe like a God's eye view type of big picture understanding of not just how quantum mechanics and general relativity are connected, but also how all of this fits into one big picture and that's how and without the rest of the big picture maybe you can't understand how quantum mechanics and general relativity are connected but within a different framework that isn't normally uh, thought of as physics both of those might emerge naturally which appears to be the case in my work and um, so i think that uh, this is the main th this is one of the main problems but it's also because of a lack of a theistic un understanding of the world and um, and part of that leads to a lack of assuming that there is intentionality to what processes the cosmos is going through and if there is a lack of intentionality then there is a lack of a lack of predictability because if somebody has it, it's much easier to to predict somebody's uh, you know, actions when you know that they have a specific goal, you know? If I know that, you know, my friend wants to eat Chick-fil-A today, if I go and wait at Chick-fil-A, I'm much more likely to see him, you know? But if I don't know that he has that goal or if he doesn't have that goal and I don't know what his goal is for the day, then running into him somewhere without coordinating, you know, specifically to meet up is not going to be very likely to happen. And uh, this is something that I think physics and every other field is suffering from as well. And this has multiple issues that, that arise from not 
looking at things from a theistic perspective is uh, one of them is that is the lack of assuming that there is an intentionality or a goal to the processes that the cosmos is going through that life is going through on earth that we are going through uh, but also that there is a uh, a kind of a, a materialistic default um, worldview that arises and what that does is it doesn't allow you to perceive the symmetries between fields. You know, I was talking to people about gender in a Discord discussion pretty recently, and um, not on my Discord, on our Discord for this project, which if you would like to join, pre please private message me on Instagram, and I will send you the link. We have uh, live calls every uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific, but, uh, but on a different Discord, and we were talking about uh, gender, and uh, and... Nobody could define it at all. And I think I can define it, but it's it's not something that would, I was gonna try and uh, you know interject into this discussion, my thoughts on gender a bit more. And um, they know my general thoughts that gender is a, it's a universal um, emergent relational, I guess like, uh, in uh, relationship, I guess, structural relationship, and um, that emerges on every scale of the universe. Um, and that I was going to try and explain on a much more fundamental level what feminine means, what masculine means, uh, as far as, you know, degrees of freedom and constraints go. What are the dimensions of femininity? What are the dimensions of masculinity? What, are the, what impact do they have on what is their dimensional impact on uh, on your you know, your degrees of freedom and constraints? Uh, if you are some type of structure that falls into one of these two categories, and I stopped because I just realized um, that they didn't even have a framework that would metaphysically allow them to to consider this because they would have to for the sake of argument, at least, completely change their fundamental worldview on the nature of the universe and of being itself in order to have any kind of understanding of what gender is. And um, if that's the case, and, gen and I'm right, and gender is, if I'm right is what I'm saying, uh, and gender is kind of a, a, a symmetry structure that transcends this, the periodicity of of growth, uh, of logos, then you have to have a specific, that you have to be building that on a specific fundamental assumption that is one that has something to do with, a that implies a hierarchy structure. And you can't imply a hierarchy structure of any kind uh, other than on the level that we can directly experience uh, with, with the purely materialistic worldview. And what this does is it limits your ability to perceive symmetry structures uh, that you would that would otherwise be obvious. And, um, and I think that this is also part of the problem in physics is, uh, is that the lack of theism has two major consequences uh, and well, multiple major consequences, but at least those two are two of them. And uh, one of them though is certainly like I said, the lack of assuming an intentionality to the cosmos, to the actions that the cosmos is going through. It's just a math soup that's settling to otherwise, you know, and that even that you can't, who made the soup, you know? You needed a cook to make the soup. You can't just have a soup. And uh, so there's lots of issues that, that arise from it, but one of them is lack of assuming an intentionality. And if you assume an intentionality, then you can, you can make predictions on, on a much more um, consistent basis because you assume that there's some type of goal to what is going on. And you think about what are, how could that goal be accomplished? But if you don't assume that there's some type of goal, then all you can assume is that maybe the universe is a bunch of soap bubbles in a bubble bath that 
nobody made the bubble bath. Apparently it just existed. And uh, it's just the multiverse. And each one is just a soap bubble. And every time the two soap bubbles collide, then it makes a new universe. Or every time that they, you know, um, uh, break apart, that's a new universe. Kind of like cells is basically the process that they're describing is um, the merging and, and dividing of cells. But that is not, first of all, cells have an intention. Bubbles don't. So they're using the bubble model because it doesn't assume an intention. But if you assume an intentionality, then there are certain things that you can start to predict. And it is, I, I will say this compl like completely confidently, I could never make the models that I have made without assuming an intentionality to the actions that the cosmos is taking. Ever. You can't do it. And... Uh, it leads to really strange issues um, uh, and and ideas like many worlds. This, which is just Sean Carroll is you know somebody who pushes that idea quite a bit. Um, let's look it up. Many worlds, Sean Carroll. Many worlds interpretation implies that there are most likely an infinite number of universes. It is one of a number of multiverse hypotheses in physics and philosophy. Uh, many worlds um, views time as a branched tree wherein every possible quantum outcome is realized. So basically, it's just this constantly dividing tree of universes, essentially. And... I don't know how much sense that actually makes, but there is a lineage of verses that's implied in sentient singularity theory. So I'm not going to say multiverse hypothesis is wrong. It's just a matter of what does that mean? Why is it happening? What is the structure that it is that is manifesting within? And uh, most likely, you know, and the, the issue is, is that you can't really test this stuff. Um, until it actually happens, and then you can just observe it if you're there for that event. Um, that's why you can't know know what happened before the Big Bang, but I, by through observation. You know, you're not going to build a strong enough telescope, I don't think, to be able to look into the preceding verse and and see what happened. And I don't even know how that would work. You wouldn't just with my theory at least. And, we're basically inside a quantum computer running on the preceding verse, um, then I don't know how much that is, how are you gonna see that, you know? You're inside the computer, good luck. But maybe, but um, it's, I, I, you're, rel you're, re you're relying on that, in that instance, you're relying on relativistic um, structures that you, and tools tools within relativity that are built to work within relativity to take you beyond relativity. And, uh, and that doesn't sound like that's going to work. You're going to have to use logic to extrapolate what happened at the beginning of it, preceding the big, you know, the beginning of the universe or what happened at the beginning of the universe. And I actually think that you can do this, and it's not nearly as difficult as people think it is. I think it's actually re remarkably simple, but in the reality, it, it would be because you're start like multiplicity is not doesn't even exist yet. I mean, you're assuming at some point in this, uh, in the initial state of this uh, of this you know universe, that multiplicity doesn't even exist. So there's not even complicated math because you don't even have lots of quantities to deal with. And um, it would be the simplest math ever. It wouldn't be the most complicated math. Now, maybe to calculate the temperature a quarter of a second after the Big Bang, that might be complicated math, but I also don't care what the temperature was. So somebody else can calculate it. I don't know what use that is, but maybe something. Um, but it's, you can't, though make logical extrapolations about what happened preceding the big the uh, or at the beginning in order to cause the beginning you cannot assume anything about what caused that really if you don't assume that there is an intentionality to what's going on and that we're basically inside a sentient being that is going through a process of 
partitioning or division, replication. And uh, that, uh, that will guide you. It will guide your logic. Logic is not just something that, you know, it's, it's, it's t- there's two aspects to logic. There's one that's like super fu- fundamental logic. It's like you're, you're just, it's the logic of fundamentality. And it's the patterns that make up a fundamental theory. It's the patterns in sentient singularity theory. And then there is logic that is your, that you apply in specific situations that, you know, are only, that only works in specific situations. But there is also this transcendent logic to what is going on in the universe. But it is, it is motivated and created and guided um, and understood in the context of a sentient being that is, that has a goal and a specific goal at that. And uh, uh, it, it, without that, you just will, you just can't, you don't know which direction to go. It's like, it's, it's the same exact thing as you trying to go somewhere or do something and not, but, but not having a specific goal of where you want to go or what you want to do. It's, it's like trying to decide what you want to do with your day without having any type of goal. Or trying to plan your... It's like trying to plan your day without having any type of goal. You can't. And uh, this is something that I need to think about a lot more because I, uh, it's something that I struggle with is not being intentional enough with, uh, with my time sometimes. But... Um, uh, and with how busy my schedule has gotten, it is definitely something that is necessary. But uh, you will it, you will not be able to plan your day without having an intention, having a goal. And um, this that planning of your day is the same thing as figuring out, you know, what's going on. So imagine trying to figure out what's going on with the cosmos beyond what you can see right in front of you without assuming any type of goal for the cosmos. You can't. Like I said, you could predict where your friend's going to be, most likely at some point in the day, if you know that he has a goal of going to Chick-fil-A, you could assume he'll probably end up at Chick-fil-A at some point. And then you could be like, okay, he's probably going to go there, like, you know, one of these three general time blocks. He's not going to be there on Sunday because they're closed. But you can't do that if you don't know that he has a goal. Same thing with the, with the universe. We have reached a point where our fields are not able to have, in order to have revolutions within our fields, within things like physics, biology, um, you know, computer science, whatever, politics, morality, gender dynamics, um, you need a big picture view and that even that big picture view you can't have it without assuming an intentionality to the actions that are going on but that would if you do um uh assume that there are symmetries and and structures that transcend specific levels of of uh material periodicity then uh or life, whatever you want to call it, sentience, then you can't, you cannot, uh, you can't view that and also see, make predictions about where it's going in the future uh, without a theistic worldview. If you have a purely materialistic worldview, it, this doesn't work. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny because we're getting moving away from moving towards idealism, like analytic idealism um, from Bernardo Castro's um, pushing that a lot. And it's a much better understanding of the universe than purely than pure materialism, because it's it doesn't eliminate materialism. What this is what people don't understand when they're saying matter doesn't exist. Yes, it does. But we just need to know what it is. And um uh, and idealism gives a framework that explains kind of what is matter. What is it that we observe as ma- concrete ma- 
uh, material reality. And but then there's a it, it it you can't say that the world is that that existence is fundamentally ideas either because I they're in a mind. Only a mind has ideas. So you can say the world is fundamentally mind, but you can't say it's fundamentally ideas. Um, you can say that that you know ideas are what causes the appearance of our material reality, but uh, you cannot say that it's fundamentally ideas. Otherwise, you will get stuck in similar uh, traps, logical traps that materialism leads to. But uh, like I said, this is this is part of the problems in physics. I think uh, that should answer some of those. But um, or I don't even know if that's the right way to put it. But I'm just saying you can't you can't answer these questions about like naturalness. Naturalness according to what? What are you expecting? Why are you expecting it? That's my point. It's like you need to have the right framework in order to know what to expect. And um, if you don't, and you're assuming that this has no purpose to it, and there is no intentions, um, there's no goal with this universe, then you, how do you know what to expect? Okay, so some numbers look really not elegant to you, but why are you even assuming elegance? That's kind of the, like my question uh, is, is like, we so we are so we've been so corrupted in our ability to think uh, due to education system and also and all the things that that has led to, including partially antitheism, is partially a, a uh, consequence of that. But uh, that that we. We don't even realize that we that our intuition is telling us something contrary constantly to what we are asserting usually in the sciences in the scientific pursuits and uh, I think that that is so odd um, you know I was talking to somebody uh, this past week too who was or last week and uh, he wanted to know more about my theory, and he was asking me questions about it uh, in some Discord group. And he was very genuine, and I appreciated it. But there was uh, parts where he's like, I, w I was like, okay, I'm, here's my argument for why we have to assume sentience is fundamental, is the fundamental definer of existence. It's not even just a fun, it's not just a, an, um, an attribute of fundamental existence. It is the defining attribute of fundamental existence. And I had given my argument for that and he was, you know, conceded that that made sense. But then he was like, but I think that you shouldn't be assuming that it applies, you know, to the universe itself or beyond you, maybe to you, but not beyond you. And I was just like, you, what, what, you have no evidence for what you are proposing right now. And you have evidence that would suggest logically the that you should apply the properties of your own uh, existence to the rest of existence, and uh, but you're not. And it's like because we are so miseducated, or what I, I don't. That's not. It, we're so screwed up because we're taught to value secondhand information above firsthand information in uh, in our school system. And we're taught it for so many years that it's it causes us to second guess our own experiences, and that is a huge problem with physics as well. Is that we are assuming the opposite of what we experience is true for the rest of the universe, and it's funny because physicists will sit there and they'll be like, you know, cosmologists will be like, well, if there's life here, there's got to be life out there in stars and on other solar systems and. And if why why would we be special? And then they will go and I would say that they're missing a lot of evidence that's right in front of their face regarding that supports the idea that there is not necessarily a bunch of multicellular organisms evolving on other planets and you know technological civilizations evolving, um, but uh, and the fact that there appears to be only one genesis of cellular life on earth it implies that it's not just a matter of the right conditions because we have the right conditions apparently but yet we only have 
one lineage, you would expect cellular life to manifest multiple times in a perfect environment. You know, why wouldn't they, why would it only happen once? And, um, uh, and that implies certain things. There's a couple different possibilities that would explain that, but, um, but, but they, the people that would say that, uh, will then sit there and state, why should we assume that our, our experience, our firsthand understanding and experience, the thing we know to be truer than anything else, um, is, is different than, than the cosmos as a whole. Like, why are we, we, it's like you're saying we are special in a different way in a way that I actually think we're not. But I but part of that is because they look at things like this and they're like, we're going to talk about panpsychism more next week. I think we're going to do a stream on um, Yosha Bach's recent discussion with Lex Friedman, but they were talking about panpsychism. I'm not done with the stream yet, but it seems very good so far. I, I think Yosha Bach is a fascinating thinker, like one of the most heterodox and also co coherent thinkers uh, out there and there's there's not as many people who are uh who can think like yosha Bach. and um uh but he he you know he stated that there's issues with panpsychism and there is it's because when we look at a pen or something like this or a rock we're like that's not that's not uh sentient and that's correct but we don't have a model that includes sentience everywhere but doesn't show but but then would not that would also explain why we would observe that our car is not sentient or that this pen is not sentient uh, even though sentience would still exist everywhere it would be like the molecules would be sentient and the atoms would be sentient um uh or the molecules may be sentient but the atoms would be sentient and the hadrons might be sentient but not the pen um and uh but this uh this, I understand why that could throw you off as if you're looking at a pen, you're like, that's not sentient. So clearly panpsychism is wrong. It's like panpsychism is incomplete, is what it is. It's incomplete. And, uh, and it's also, because it's incomplete, it's been misled. So then you start hearing people say things like, everything has some type of consciousness. This water bottle has some type of consciousness. No. You've just defined consciousness out of existence. So I understand. But it, it's, you know, you can't take a wrong turn. It, uh, or if you do, like, you need to be able to recognize that at some point you took a wrong turn. Um, or it should be apparent. Obviously, all of us can take a wrong turn and not realize it, myself included. But um, uh, I think that it's, it's also possible to not take a wrong turn. Not saying ever, but you know. so here, next clip. But natural, you know, he, I don't know if naturalist, these naturalist questions, naturalness questions have anything to do with why, you know, I know Sean Carroll calls himself a poetic naturalist. If you ask him, are you an atheist? Are you a theist? Are you, he'll be like, I'm a poetic naturalist. He's an anti-theist, but um, uh, a poetic naturalist, I'm a poetic naturalist. What does that even mean? It means you see the beauty in the, uh, in the, the logic of nature. Okay, so do I, that's fine. That's, you know, it does appear like there is that the universe that we get, that we are in, could, it appears like God had no choice in the rules of the universe that we're in, given his goal. And, um, but you can't know that, that, why that would be the case if you don't assume a goal either. So, uh, and, you know, Eric, um, Eric Weinstein starts this geometric unity paper off with a, uh, a question that Albert Einstein asked was, uh, I wonder if God had any choice in the rules of the universe or the, the laws of physics, basically. And uh, I will say that it, it appears, it appears, I'm not saying it is the case, but it appears in my work that he had no choice in the laws of physics and the structure of, of the 
growth of life in the universe. Uh, it seems like it was the structure that he had to follow and his constraints and degrees of freedom were not, uh, he had no choice in them. He was highly, e extraordinarily constrained because he, you're starting from oneness. And you also are starting with a goal in mind. And, uh, and if you know those two things, then you can actually map a highly constrained universe. But if you don't assume either one of those two things, then you can't map anything. Uh, you can map a bunch of different possibilities, but like you, none of them have any weight over the others, and other than just maybe your personal preferences. Um, so this has led to a crisis in physics. Um, this is a clip of, just to show it because it's funny. This is why Sean Carroll, this is a clip that he doesn't like, uh, that I uh, made. But it, it, I'm just showing the lack of, um, of direction in this, and we'll, we'll explain it in a minute. But, and like I said, I have a huge amount of respect for Sean Carroll. Please subscribe to his YouTube channel. You can learn a lot from him. I plan on going and re-watching all of the old physics lectures that I watched uh, in 2020 because I realized that I need a refresher for sure in order to like, I try, I've been trying to learn more and I realized I need a refresher in order to, on, on some things before I can learn more. Um, but here. So in Sean Carroll's lecture, God is not a good theory, this is how he opens the lecture. If you did believe that God was a necessary being, that you literally could not imagine a universe in which God did not play an important role, in order logically for me to refute that belief, all I need to do is to invent a universe in which God does not exist. Invent a universe in which God does not exist. So according to Sean Carroll, all we have to do in order to show that a conscious creator is not necessary to the existence of a universe is consciously create a universe. Does anybody else see the problem with this? Okay, so this is, I mean, Hopefully that's obvious to you why that's a problem. He is God in that model that he put forward. He is God. So he can't say God isn't necessary because he is acting as God in his example. He is creating the universe. And in that uh, lecture, though, he goes on to state, here's a simple universe I could create without, you know, necess necessity, it necessitating a, um, a conscious creator. And he's like, it's just a simple particle that just goes around and around and around. And there's things about this that actually make this a good choice for um, the model. But um, uh, it, he does, but the, the point is, is that you could make, he could have thrown anything up there, is my point. Because he's assuming that there's no goal. And if you assume that there's no goal, then the consequence is, uh, the consequence is, the only reason why everything looks so perfect for the, you know, perfectly tuned to seem like there's some type of goal in mind because there's growth happening in this universe uh, and that is beating entropy to some, you know, in, in a fundamental way, uh, that the, the only reason why this could be the case is because there's infinite number of universes and we just happen to be in the one that could support life, which that's just a, we don't understand what that means yet. So it's just that in and of itself is misleading. And, um, uh, and this is part of what I mean by though, you need philosophers to come in and, and look at these fields con and how they connect and take a holistic view on things to answer questions like, what is gravity? What is life? What is consciousness how is consciousness how is life you know like you need these what is the meaning of life you need philosophers in order to be able to 
tell you that that might not be even a good question. You know, that's what I, my work seems to imply is that most of these questions are bad questions. And um, especially the one on what is the meaning of life and, and uh, you know, how did life begin? And they, those are bad questions. They cannot be answered in our current framework. And um, this is also true of things with gravity and, uh, and unification of quantum mechanics and general relativity and gravity and uh, the other three fundamental forces. You're going to need some type of holistic, harmonized view. There's a guy who was going on Kurt Chimungle's podcast soon, um, I think, uh, who was claim making the claim that gravity is something that you're gonna that's gonna be harmonized with the other forces, but not unified this in a traditional way. That makes sense, uh, I think. And um, uh, Eric Weinstein stated the same thing, and my work implies seems to imply something like that. I don't. I wouldn't have used the word harmonized because I'm not a musician, but. Uh, maybe that is the right terminology. I just am not a musician, kind of. I can play a bit of ukulele. But, um, uh, and, but this is, this, he could have put any universe after his statement, and it would have been fine if there's no uh, purpose to the universe. There's no intentions involved with, with its, development but because uh of that and because then you can put any uh you know universe that you just want to come up with uh up there which does it still doesn't disprove god because you're acting as god in the model but uh it does um uh show that a lack of assume of of, in, of intentionality of assumed intentionality is one is going to lead you down a non-path. There is, you're going to no longer see any path. There is no path. Paths lead you to somewhere, and um, uh, and so I don't know. That's like my point on that. I hope that that makes sense. But it, it he could have put any universe that he said. Um, or that he could have said after that statement, and it would have been fine. But that just shows that, you know, which universe could you put up there? Because he even said, he's like, this universe with a single particle going around and around, and he's like, this isn't our universe. And first of all, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's a good conversation to get at. The universe is is an evolving thing, but is what I will say. But, um, uh, but then he's like, but it is a universe. It's like, okay, well, you're going to, you, the fact that you can just make, you think you can just make a universe that is not our universe. It's just totally detached from any kind of guidance. Because you could have also made our universe. But you could have made our universe or another universe. Then you get many worlds. That's what you get. You get many worlds. You get anything that could ex that 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 uh, it's not even anything that could exist does exist because a lot of what is assumed to be able to exist can't exist uh, regarding these 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 cosmological ideas and uh, like I said it appears to me like the universe is super constrained and uh, that it's like the opposite it's it's funny because that seems more logical than any than an idea of like you know every time some change happens in some form or fashion it splits the universe and there's a, this many worlds idea like it's just nonsense um and i understand where it came from but it it comes from avoiding uh certain assumptions that imply theism i'm not saying he did it con not consciously it's just that you if you're if you're not going to, you're not willing to include the idea that there is an intentionality to the processes of the cosmos, then and and its existence, then you know you're just then that's all you have to do to um, to have no path forward. 
you know. So there's a lot there there's lots of problems with physics and every other field, and they all stem from a lack of a theistic worldview. And I'm not talking about scriptures or anything like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about any specific religion. I'm talking about the idea that that existence is a single sentient being initially and is has a goal in its partitioning of of its sentience into smaller sentient beings within itself and uh and that that idea is it is the one that you must the logic of our own experience implies that that is the most likely scenario and uh it's it we're so confused by our school system um kind of removing us from practicing thinking uh that we we will deny that that is the most likely scenario even though it is obviously the scenario that your mind that you actually should assume given the evidence uh, that you have access to, which is partially your own experience, which is firsthand information above anything else. And uh, you're denying it. You're like putting that below uh, the your own internal experience regarding your nature. I'm not talking about like, I don't know, feelings that you have of any kind. I'm talking about the feeling of feeling itself is something that cannot be denied. And, um, and if you deny that, then, it, then you're just, you bro, you're just not thinking. I mean, you're just not. <laughs> you, the fact that you have to deny it in and of itself means that it is true. And, uh, but that, but that must be the thing that you assume above anything else to be true is that you are sentient and that sentience therefore is the nature of existence as best you know it, you know? And it's funny because people will say things like, well, no, the cup isn't sentient and it exists. It's not even a cup without you calling it a cup. You didn't, if you didn't make it into a cup, then it wouldn't exist. So let's take a, I don't know, a rock, if you're not going to assume that's, you know, there's, let's just assume for a second that this has not, is not made of sentient beings or anything like that. And that I don't assume this to be sentient. But if you're like, the rock exists and no, there's no sentience which, first of all, that's inconsistent with sentient singularity theory because there's entanglement relationships going on that are holding this together into a structure that then we could perceive as a rock. But if you're not there to perceive it as a rock, even if you're just scrapped for a second that the molecules and atoms could be sentient, and you're just assuming that rock, if there's no one to perceive rock, then it isn't rock. Okay? And... Uh, and it goes deeper than that because, like I said, this is made of sentient beings still. And uh, so there is no way to escape this, th this fact that things are defined by beings. Not Beings do not come from things. Things are defined by beings. They are perceived by beings, but they are not responsible for the creation of beings. Things are secondary. Beings are primary. And inf the logic of information itself would necessitate that to be almost seemingly 100% likely. You know, if you have information in a system that is enclosed, like a universe, and there is nothing outside it, then it is enclosed. And if you have information in it, then information is self-referencing because it's not referencing anything else. It has to reference itself because it's referencing this, you know, it exists within this closed system. But if there's no one to perceive the information, then there isn't even information. So people say things like, the universe is fundamentally information. And it's funny, you know, there there was that Clear Win video that is great, I will admit. Clear Win and the Quantum Gravity Research Foundation made a What is Reality video. I highly recommend watching it. It's on YouTube. It is great. 
when I first started this project, that I, I remember I came across that pretty early on and I was like, because I didn't think anybody else had seemed to have very similar ideas to me because I'm so used to a materialistic, you know, uh, traditional scientific narrative. And, um, and so then I came across this video that he had created as millions of views. And I was like, wow, this is so similar to what I'm working on and the implications of my work. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. And in it, they're joking. They have this little animated skit of these physicists arguing over what is the reality. They're like, it's matter. And the guys, Einstein comes in, he's like, no, it's energy. And he's like, no, it's matter. He's like, no, it's energy. And then somebody else comes in and they're like, no, it's information. And he's like, no, it's energy. And he's like, no, it's information. And then somebody's like, energy is information. And the reality is, is that there's no such thing as information without someone in, who is informing and being informed. There is no information outside of mind. And, um, uh, and so it, it's like that. It did take that step, kind of, that video. It did say, you know, it seems like the universe is some type of consciousness. We shouldn't anthropomorphize it, which I disagree with. Um, but uh, it still was, you know, it got there. But it's that's what fundamental reality must be, logically. And your personal experience does suggest that. The information that you should trust above all other information that you can perceive. Your internal understanding of your own existence. The defining attribute of your own existence should be the single piece of information that you assume to be true above all else. You don't actually know whether or not this pen is sentient. I don't think it is. My work doesn't suggest that it is. I don't think that it is. And logically, I don't think that it makes sense that it is. But you don't know. You know you're sentient. It's the only thing that you know is that sentience exists. And yet we're denying it as the defining attribute of existence when it defines our existence. It is it is a breakdown in logic. And I, I suffered from it for 25 years of my life. So um, I'm not, you know, judging anyone about it. Uh, it's, not, it's not their fault. It's nobody's fault. If you're an anti-theist, it's not your fault. I'm not, I don't judge you if you're an anti-theist. Or I try not to, and if I do, then whenever, I, if I ever do judge you for being an anti-theist, then I, that's a failure on my part. But um, you know, as long the as long as somebody's honest about what they believe and what they think, then that's all that. Th then they should be judged as being honest, which is about as good as it gets. Um, I mean, you know, be it, it's the. I don't want to say it's as good as it gets, but it is the, it's the, it's the starting point. <laughs> uh, and that is important. Uh, it's the foundation of, of good is honest. Um, so, um, it, it, it's, it's very odd just where we're at, but we are in a crisis of physics. But here, this next part is about string theory, and um, and theories of everything. And Eric Weinstein is a huge critic of string theory, and uh, and you know he's the one who's motivating this prop, mostly this uh, this stream that Sean Carroll did. But here, any little minority that we're trying something completely different. And it's not that the community said, let's think about quantum gravity, it's that the string theorist said, here, you have a theory of quantum gravity right here that is very compatible with everything that we know otherwise, and might even be a theory of everything that also explains the standard model and so forth. So it wasn't that people sat around and said, what's the best way to quantize gravity? It's that this theory of quantum gravity fell in their lap. People like Ed Witten said, this is a 21st century theory that somehow found its way into the 1980s, and we're going to spend decades figuring out what it's saying. Now be very, very fair, there was an enormous amount of overhype about string theory in the 1980s uh, because, because it was potentially a theory of everything. People really got interested in this idea. Could you predict 
not just that there is gravity, which is nice, but also predict all the standard model and maybe some supersymmetric version of the standard model and get the dark matter and figure out what all the parameters are and all those things. That was absolutely an ambition that people had in string theory in the 1980s. It didn't work. <laughs> As you know, we would have told you if that had worked now, it got worse over time. Um, but also, since I was there, I can tell you that even though string theory was very, very hyped, there was a bandwagon that was launched in the 1980s, people were still quite skeptical or at least cautious about it. Many of the best physics departments in the world didn't hire any string theorists at the time because they weren't sure whether the idea was just going to go away, whether it was just a fad. It really, the, the switch really flipped in the 90s when we had what is called the second superstring revolution. We had the first revolution in 1984 with Green and Schwartz and the anomaly cancellations. In the 1990s, Joe Polchinski pointed out that string theory is not just a theory of strings. There are also these things called D-brains, Dirichlet brains, which are not one-dimensional strings, but some of them are one-dimensional, but there's also two-dimensional brains, three-dimensional brains, four-dimensional brains, etc. This is brain B-R-A-N-E, a back construction out of membrane, okay? So Polchinski pointed out the importance of these D-brains for the fundamental way of defining string theory. That became very exciting. And then Witten quickly pointed out that in fact, what was going on is that what we thought were five separate string theories back in the 80s was just five different limits of a single theory. And in fact, there's a sixth limit called 11 dimensional supergravity, okay? Which is not even a string theory, but it's a limit of this Ur theory, this overall theory called M theory. And then Maldacena, pointed out that this idea of holography that had been bandied about in the context of black holes by Tuft and Susskind, et cetera, had this wonderful property that you could implement it in what is called the ADS-CFT correspondence, where you have a five-dimensional anti-de-sitter space, which is a cosmological space-time that has a boundary at infinity that you can think of as flat space-time in one lower dimension. And there is, you can imagine, defining a ordinary non-gravitational quantum field theory on the boundary that is holographically equivalent to the quantum gravity theory in the anti de Sitter bulk. This is all amazingly, you know, exciting kind of stuff. So M theory, ADS, CFT, D brain. Okay, so first of all, um, uh, I did do an interview a long time ago on here with Luis Razo, who um, uh, has theory regarding ADS, CFT, and how it's very similar to my work in some ways, is that it implies that we're inside of a mind. And, um, uh, but it's, I recommend watching it, but also w what's interesting about what he says here is that, uh, he's saying that when we, that everybody thought that string theory would be a theory of everything and not only would just explain, you know, unite quantum mechanics and general relativity, but also would basically explain why the standard model is what it is. You know, it would, it would give you the reasons why, it would explain why the standard model uh, has the structures that it has, has the symmetries that it has, has the particles. Um, I, I like calling them points. Uh, I think it's more accurate. Has the points that it has. Um, calling them particles mi is misleading everyone. But, um, and that's interesting because in my video theories of everything the how-to guide which i highly suggest watching it's linked below but it also is should be the video that pops up when you first go on my youtube channel it was my entry into the pace one contest um with kurt chai mungle's theories of everything channel that he put on which was a physics and consciousness video project uh in there i state that a theory of everything or a fundamental theory if it explains the structures of the standard model and it explains gravity and it explains you know how to unify a bunch of different structures not even just with you know general relativity and quantum mechanics and stuff but like other other structures as well then it's not just a theory of physics it's a theory that explains physics and it's very difficult to figure out what what is the line of physics because at what point is physics now metaphysics? And the problem is, is that there is this one fuzzy spot called quantum mechanics and, um, and or quantum physics or whatever you want to call it. And, um, and when you're dealing with the, in that in space, you're, you are dealing with mental information structures and you are part of that system that is that 
of observation and and uh, and generation, and uh, this is basically metaphysics at this point, and but that also if it's metaphysics then it transcends just physics and it goes you know across all fields and i, I said this in my video that it's if you have a theory that explains this the structures in the standard model and the particles in the standard model then it is not a theory of physics it is a theory that explains physics which is a theory i would say of metaphysics stephen wolfram would call it a theory of metamathematics but that's probably just to avoid using the word metaphysics because it has theological implications and or associations, at least, even if it's not implications. And so uh, this, is, this is tough because we're leaving, we're assuming that the only people that can answer this problem, these problems, these questions, uh, regarding, you know, fundamental physics, even more fundamental than what we currently have, um, are physicists with training in just basically memorization of what we currently have modeled and can observe. And, um, and that is a problem. And I, I say that in my video though, I was like, one of the first problems that we need to figure out is whether questions is whether or not this is even a, a, a physics problem in the first place, or is it more? It, it's also a physics problem. This is what people don't understand. They're like, is it physics or is it something else? It's not even the right question to ask that. Is it physics and something else? Is it something else and physics is actually a better way of, of, of phrasing a potential answer. And that's the truth. That's the reality of the situation. It's something, it's a theory of something else and physics. It's a theory of something else and biology. It's a theory of something else and every other field if it's a theory of what is at the very bottom. And if you're assuming that we can have a theory that explains the standard model, then you are assuming that it is not the very bottom. And it's not. And um, that is uh, because if it was the very bottom, then it wouldn't just be a theory with points or particles, quote unquote, that we can observe. Uh, it would be a theory, and, and some of those we can't observe actually, you know, quarks we don't observe. We just extrapolate their existence due to math. And Sean Carroll talks about that in here and how like physics, science is more than just observation. Um, it is also logical extrapolation. And this is why I, I, don't, I don't even really like the term science. I don't know what is a better term for it, but um, just thinking like figuring things out, I don't know. But um, it, it, but, if, but because we put a label on it called science, it's like, this is science, this is not science. Now you've already like, you framed it in a way that might limit you. Um, and uh, and it, it does, and you end up with, um, you know, issues. And Sean Carroll correctly points that out in this. But uh, he, he, But when he says here, a theory of everything it will explain the standard model. It's like, that means it's not necessarily a theory of physics, or maybe it shouldn't be called a theory of physics. And I don't think it should. It's a metaphysics theory, which is a theory of mind, really, and a theory of physics. It's both. But... here next this next clip is about uh, gravity unification but let me just check the chat uh, thank you for having this discussion when do Weinstein and Carol join the stream uh, in my quotes and in my plays I would love for both of them to join the stream they are ev they don't have to be on together but I doubt that would happen on here that would be the most epic uh, showdown ever. But I'm, that's not, I think that if they did that, they should go on Kirchheim Ungol's podcast uh, channel and Weinstein versus, not even versus, but just, you know, with Sean Carroll. But I doubt that will happen. They don't seem to get along very well. Um, 
But I will say that it was Eric Weinstein, though, that pointed out this stream from uh, Sean Carroll to to me, not just to me, but like on Twitter, I saw him post it. And he said that he thought it was a valuable thing to share. And uh, so I was like, okay, I'm going to watch it. And so, you know, there's respect, at least. Um, meta mathematical. Yeah. Quantum physics and below, uh, the Ruliad is metaphysical in mind. Or yes, as you said, meta mathematical. Yeah. Um, it's below mathematics. That's what people people don't understand that even it's like math isn't even fundamental. There is an explanation for quantities, which you need for math. There is an explanation for the order of operations in mathematics. And uh, in, a metaf in a metaphysics theory, in my metaphysics theory, there is. Um, and so, and it comes out naturally, all the quantities what they are, where they come from, why, what certain uh, mathematical operations are, and where do they first occur in the in the cosmos, you know, in the logos of the cosmos, and uh, so it, they are generated at that point. They don't exist prior. Math is not something that always existed and must and is just discovered. It is, it is generated, which means it's like discovered and created by the cosmos as it grows and um, uh, and quantities are generated and in, you know interacting so next clip this is Sean Carroll's talking about a gravity would require possibly a different kind of theory and I think he's right. but the nice thing is one decay every 10 to the 35 years isn't that often, but what physicists know how to do is get a lot of particles together in the same place. So you can wait around and hope to see a proton decaying. And they did wait around and hope they did not see any protons decaying. So that was a blow, right? By the way, that is consistent with my work as well. Um, grand unification. Grand unification is the label given to this idea of strong plus electroweak theory being unified. It does not include gravity. Grand unified theories, or guts as they were called, have nothing to do with gravity. They were a very big topic in the 1970s. They made a prediction that a proton would decay, and it didn't. Again, as in many other cases, uh, physicists are clever. You don't give up. You say, well, OK, we can still grand unify, but we can change around some of the parameters and some of the patterns and we can increase the lifetime of the proton so that you don't see it yet. Absolutely fair, people did that. But the enthusiasm for grand unification has declined because it made a prediction that didn't come true. That's perfectly fair, that's what should happen. Again, no crisis going on. You're still trying because maybe it's true, but you're less enthusiastic than you were before. Then in the 1980s with string theory, there was the first well-posed theory they could unify, in principle, gravity with all the other forces, right? So that was very exciting, and people worked on that, and that was the theory of everything. So you still, to this day, now it's 2023, see a bunch of non-professional physicists thinking very hard about unifying things, unification, one form of unification or another. And what they've missed is that it's not the 1980s anymore, and it would be great to unify gravity with the other forces of nature. That's a fine thing to think about doing, but it ain't enough. We know more now from thinking about the challenges of quantum gravity to realize that the real challenge, the real interest, is not in unifying gravity with the other forces. You can play around with math and try to do that. The real challenge is that gravity seems to be a different kind of theory. It is not a straightforward quantum field theory. There's plenty of reasons to think that gravity is in some sense fundamentally non-local. It looks local in the weak field, effective field theory limit, etc. Local in the sense that if you poke the universe at one point, all the disturbances move away at the speed of light or less, right? But in gravity, in quantum gravity, you can imagine wormholes, virtual wormholes, or all sorts of weird space-time geometries. In black holes, you have the idea that all the information is somehow encoded at the horizon. Somehow when the black holes evaporate, information travels from the inside to the outside. All of these non-local things going on. ADSC of T is an example of an explicitly non-local connection between two different kinds of theories. So the challenge, the interest, the fun part of quantum gravity is not in unifying it with the other forces of nature. That's fine, let's try to do that. That would have been a hot topic in the 1980s, still interesting. But now we have much more subtle, challenging features of quantum gravity that we would like to explain. So people are trying, but you know, 
there's some fraction of people who are trying, right? Uh, what you will find, uh, you know, I've interviewed a whole bunch of string theorists. Uh, they're, they're honestly string theorists. People in that camp here on Mindscape. I almost don't want to forget anyone, but I already mentioned Annie Strominger. There was Clifford Johnson, Raphael Busso, Dada Engelhardt, right? Um, other people, Michael Dine has worked on the phenomenological side of string theory, and they don't want to call themselves string theorists. <laughs> and it's not because they're embarrassed with string theory, it's because, you know, sometimes they're doing string theory, sometimes they're not, who cares? They're doing theoretical physics, they're trying to understand the world. And the ultimate answers we get to how the world works might very well end up being inspired by string theory, but not being string theory, and that's fine. And those, I think that that set of activities is still very exciting. How could you not listen to the podcast I did with Natalie or Raphael or Andy and, and not be excited by what's going on there? So I don't think this is a crisis either. You know, I think the quantum gravity is a very weird thing. It's experimentally very, very difficult to think about. Um, but we've made sort of more progress than we really have any right to expect, honestly, in quantum gravity. And maybe we will continue to do that. Maybe we'll continue to get lucky. But the fact that we're not done yet, the fact that we haven't completed it, that we haven't figured out exactly the path from M theory to the standard model of particle physics, in my mind, is the least surprising thing in the world. That's one of the reasons why I don't do string theory myself. I, I think it is the best, uh, most promising route we have to quantizing gravity compared to all the other routes. But it's hard. It's hard to make progress on it. And I think that there's other ways that we could think about. So that's my, I know I told you at the beginning it was going to go on, right? But, you know, you're not forced to do this. You're not, there's no test at the end. Yeah. So uh, I think that uh, he's right, though, is that, like, gravity is, it's a different kind of force. It's a different kind of thing. And my work implies that. And it's, it's that there is a symmetry structure there that you can use to start making predictions. I'm not a, you know, a trained physicist, so I'm not going to exactly claim, you know, exact how it unifies with certain other um, you know, things in physics, but I will say that um, uh, it it does seem like that the gravity, the symmetry structure of gravity with my, in, in, according to my work, is vertical symmetry structure. It's not on the same plane of, of the cosmos. It's not on the same periodicity uh, as, um, as the other three forces, which are in the same plane and so it makes sense that you would be able to unify those and not gravity in the in the in a specific way um but you need to think about vertical causation uh that's not a term that i came up with but someone i forgot who it was but i think it was i forgot someone on um kurt john Mungle's podcast i think said i think it was um uh oh gosh what's his name um Wolfgang, I think is his name, but uh, I think he was the one who was talking about vertical causation. But you need to think about vertical, like a, a vertical causation, um, in order to think about gravity. I think, um, and and be able to harmonize it and and fit it into um, a symmetry structure that is uh, that makes sense. And and that is, it, but that means like you have to step outside your field. You know, you basically have to become a thea theist. It's funny because the guy who's used the term ver vertical causation, he, he is a theist. And, uh, and he seems to be able to figure out which direction to look. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, that's a different kind of theory. So, um, and then... This is him talking about why he thinks people say that physics is in a crisis. And I don't think I agree with him on this, but you can, we'll let him say. Those three aspects of physics that were arguably you know, crisis laden. Uh, the fact that we have not yet pinned down the right models for the dark matter and dark energy. The fact that we have these naturalness problems and we keep coming up with theories to explain them, but they don't really seem to work. And the whole difficulty of quantum gravity and trying to find the right theory for that. Um, so, with that in mind, with that as background, what is the crisis? What is the purported disastrous situation that physics is in? You know, I think that, I don't want to be too unfair here, but I think a lot of the, if you dig into the specific arguments given by people who claim there's a crisis in physics, a lot of the time they come down to, other people aren't working on my favorite ideas. <laughs> Which is fine, like, everyone thinks that. Like, if you, if you, you only have a finite lifespan, right? And if you're a researcher, you only have a, finite number of ideas that you can pursue, papers that you can write, etc. 
And if you, you're going to work on those ideas that you think are most interesting and promising. And when those ideas turn out to be in the minority, then you feel like everyone else is making a mistake. Why aren't they doing things my way? Why are they doing my favorite new theory of, of whatever? I get that. But it's, and this is, if there's a lesson to this whole long extended podcast, it's the following. When we're in a situation where we don't know what the right answer is, or where we think that there is a theory that is better than the physical theories that we have right now, but we don't know which one it is, on the one hand, it's perfectly natural to spend your time working on what you think is the most promising way forward. But if you're honest about the health of the field as a whole, then you should hope that the field as a whole works on many different things, because you don't know what the right answer is. So if, if anyone is claiming there's a crisis in physics, and you dig down deeply into their justification for saying that, and it comes down to people are working on other ideas, not the ideas that I like, I wouldn't take that too seriously. People are supposed to work on different ideas. And this whole situation is very hard because, as we've discussed, we have a very good effective field theory. We have a theory that fits the data very, very well. There's some theories that we don't have. Okay, so this is the, the, the main point. Okay, as somebody who is claiming that there is a, I'm not the only one, but I'm one of the people who is claiming that there is a crisis in physics, but it's not in just physics, it's in all fields. But I'm, but the, but the physics is kind of the closest one to getting uh, at why is there a crisis in even all the other fields, I would say. And because um, uh, we're trying to figure out what is the nature of, what, what, what is the universe, essentially. And, um, but I would say that's not actually what physics is. It's, physics is how not the why or the or the what it's the how uh, and as soon as it becomes the why or the what it becomes metaphysics um, uh, and um, this the, but when he says here that you know when people say physics is in a crisis it means that you, they're probably just n mad that nobody else is focusing on the ideas that are their favorite favorite ideas I don't know how true that is. I think that depends on who, who what, who it is, um, really very much so, and what their idea is as well. Because um, I want there to be lots of ideas pursued in everything, you know, and I want the best ideas to win. But at the same time, my main issue is not that nobody's looking at sentient singularity theory or anything like that, but my main issue is that there is a lack of um, theistic, of, of, of theological models that are taken seriously in physics. There are a few physicists out there that are theists, and whether they say it publicly or not, and some of them do say it publicly, it's very rare. And, um, they are so incredibly rare that you could count them on your hand. At least the ones that end up being well known. It's not a bunch of ideas that are just being all thought about. And yeah, I understand that. And Sean Carroll goes on to give him some credit. He talks about how there is a process that institutions go through where they, it, you know, you do see some type of homogeneity, hom homogeneity homogeneity I don't know if I'm I can't say that right now but you know what I'm getting at there where a lot of people are thinking the same thing and uh, have the same ideas and that makes sense I get that I understand why institutions end up like that the incentive structures and everything I get it at the same time this is this is this, when it comes to theistic implications being taken seriously in this in the scope of you know this discussion and uh it, that is extraordinarily rare it's so rare in fact and it's so rejected in fact that it is hidden by more physicists that i know who are hiding it than uh it is admitted by physicists in public i know i know more hidden theists than I know uh, out theists, open theists in physics who have degrees in 
math or PhDs in math or physics and and accreditations in the in those fields and work on those subjects. That is not the uh, a, a, just a a bunch of ideas that are you know we're, that we're working on a bunch of ideas. No, there is theism is taken as it's mocked and um uh and that is a problem like that is a big problem i think in every field for ev for every field and if you really wanted to break down physics into what different types of theories there are you really could only break it down into two theories one of them is sentience is fundamental and the other one is sentience is emergent and that's it those are the two types of physics theories those are the two types of any theories those are the two types of uh, two that is the two paths of uh, of potential worldviews and 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 understandings of of our universe that you can have one of them is sentience is fundamental and you can call that essentially theism and uh and the other one is that sentience is emergent and not fundamental. That beings come from things instead of things being defined and perceived and coming from beings. And uh, everything else is trivial. You know, people will say things like, oh, it's, is, is it fundamentally matter? Is it fundamentally energy? Is it fundamentally information? Is it fundamentally ideas? Is it fundamentally, um, uh, you know, matter? Is it fundamentally strings or is it fundamentally particles all of this stuff is trivial and almost all of it is a matter of perspective and almost all of it is subjectively true in certain specific instances the two truly different directions that physics and every other field can go is theism and not theism and s sentientism and not, you know, uh, inanimate-ism, I guess. Those are the two types of theories. We do not have accurate representations between those two. We do not. Every single one of these proposed theories that does end up gaining some traction in academia, all of them are anti-theist theories. All of them. All of them. Many Worlds is anti-theist. It is built on an idea that there is no purpose to the to the cosmos. There is no intention, and that is that is it is built on that very idea. And so is so are all these other ideas that are out there, for you know that that have been entertained by um, physicists. It's like what is a theory of everything? Oh, it's a loop quantum gravity. Okay, that. A lot of those terms are important, actually, to defining attributes of, I think, senti uh, sentient beings, but none of them express the actual nature. It's all just structure, and that's it. It's like string theory, particle theory, you know, relativity theory. But it's like none of these are describing a nature, and that's because... The reality is that the things that have a nature are beings and everything else doesn't have a nature to it. It doesn't have any attributes to it outside of our own definitions and perception. And, uh, and that's, I realize that that's not a conscious thought by most people who are anti-theists or atheists, usually they'll call themselves, or poetic naturalists, but they are anti-theist. That is actually the reality is there's only anti-theism and theism. There is not anything else. There is no atheism. There is no agnosticism. There is anti-theism and theism. There's confident anti-theism and confident theism and not so confident theism and not so confident anti-theism. But there's only two degrees of freedom. That's it. You can't ride the middle. You can't. Being in the middle is a state of change. You're in a state of change. You are either were this and are moving to that, or you were that and are moving to this. That's the only time you're in the middle. You're never just in the middle. 
on anything that you actually have any kind of understanding of at all. And you do have an understanding of the universe and of existence because you exist in the universe every day. And, um, but if, you know, like I said, you can only be agnostic about topics you have no ex exposure to. Like me and Bigfoot. I have no exposure to Bigfoot. I don't know really anything about it. And I am agnostic about it. I don't have thoughts about it. I really don't. I mean, if I sit here and I think about it, though, then, yeah, I'm going to end up having some thoughts about it. But, like, none of them are conclusive either because I don't have enough engagement with it. But you have engagement with existence because you exist. And so um, you have thoughts about about it. Do you think that the universe is a sentient being? Or do you think that there was no sentience and then sentience emerged through to the settling of the soup? And either one is fine as long as you're honest, but those are the two degrees of freedom of physics. And everything. Everything. And uh, there is not accurate representation between those two. There is not. That is the crisis in physics. That's the real crisis in physics. It's not, are we working on string theory? Or are we working on loop quantum gravity? Or are we entertaining, you know, um, SO10? Or like, what? like, no. None of that is the crisis. The crisis is, is theism taken seriously. And I will admit, to Sean Carroll's credit, and I tried listening to some of it, but honestly, it was just... I need to try harder, but I couldn't continue listening to it. It was Sean Carroll had on uh, someone, a biologist of some type, and they were talking about theism and evolution. And uh, honestly, I think that most theists who are discussing evolution, people like Stephen Meyer and stuff, while I agree with their ultimate conclusion about the nature of reality, I don't agree with their arguments as being very good arguments. There's much better arguments for theism and uh, than anything that you're putting forward about evolution and, and how we can't explain how this got to this. Saying we can't explain does not mean theism. You have to give a logical, positive assertion. If information is contained within a self enclosed system it must therefore be self-referencing because otherwise it's not information about anything you know it can't be information about anything else like that is a logical idea of the universe is apparently inevitably self-referencing or self-aware if you like think about it hard hard enough that's what that means it is aware of itself because it can't it can only be aware of itself there can't there's nothing else to be aware of at least initially and uh, and so you know you can also logically construct the argument that you must trust your own internal experience of what is the defining attribute of your experience of existence and assume that that is normative even if you don't assume the water bottle is sentient, which you shouldn't, but you should assume that sentience uh, is the defining it is the defining attribute um, uh, of existence itself, as best you understand it. Like that, th these are ben much better arguments towards theism. One of them is straight up for theism, the first one. The second one is towards theism. But it's but it's 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 like you sh it's the arg it's kind of a meta argument. It's an argument of you must assume that re that existence is sentient because of the ex because of the way in which you should uh, prioritize your your information that you have available to you that you that you are able to perceive or think about or be told or experience, the one that gets prioritized the most is your own internal experience of what is existence itself. Like that is every, nothing else that you are told or observe or think about should be able to trump that. And if it is, then you are not thinking in a, lo in a logically coherent fashion.
you're not prioritizing the right information. And I will absolutely state that that is the case. So even, even it doesn't necessarily, it's not a direct argument for theism in a way, it's like an indirect argument because it's basically saying you have to assume theism, but uh, in order to be a logical thinker, is what it's basically saying. Um, more so than it is saying that, it, you know, the universe is a sentient being, but it does have um, secondary implications that that is the case. But it, it has, its, its primary implication is that you must assume that that is the case in order to be a logical thinker. And um, it's like, this is much more interesting than being like, well, how long, you know, look at how, we had this Cambrian explosion. I do not care about the Cambrian explosion, but I will give Sean Carroll credit for having on a theist and taking him seriously enough to talk about it. But none of these theists are succeeding in, in, in making good arguments for God, I don't think. Uh, they're not making the best arguments for God. Uh, Stephen Meyer is not, even though, like I said, I agree with these guys but uh, inevitably, but not, they're not picking good arguments. And that's because they are so, they're just focused on what science doesn't, can't explain. So the, even what's his name does this, um, uh, he, gosh, uh, Tor, um, Jim, Jim Tor, James Tor, uh, he'll say things like, we can't explain the, you know, existence of cells. Uh, and we have no explanation for it. And we have no explanation for multicellular life. And that's true. But that isn't an argument for God either. It's, it might suggest that there might be a God, but it, and I actually think that it, when you actually get to what is going on with, you know, these leaps in sentience, or these periodicity of sentience from molecules to cells to organisms, etc., that you actually do need God to explain those. Um, but uh, you must assume God prior to those. You can't meet those and be like, because I can't get to the next step without God, I should assume God. Because you've skipped all these other things where you're, you've realized you can't explain anything existing without God or anyone. That's where you should start first. Not where do we where, not try and f fill in the gaps with God, but um, uh, but but try and showcase why it is the th that it's illogical to think otherwise, and uh, and why it's also illogical, or why why it is logical to um, that that existence is self aware information system, which, what is that? You know, so uh, this is the crisis in physics, though, is the lack of theists that know how to make the right arguments. And that's why they tie, try and tend to keep uh, their mouth shut. And unless they are like Stephen Meyer, and they, they kind of, and, and, you know, the guy who went on Sean Carroll's podcast, from what I heard, they kind of they're resting on their PhDs. They're like, I have a PhD in philosophy of science or in biology, and therefore I should be taken seriously. And that's actually, I think that's wrong. I understand why we have a society built on that, but that's, we're, maybe there was a point where that made more sense, but that we have passed that. And, um, uh, and so they rest on that, and they rest on kind of just showing how much they know about what science, has described or what has been described in the scientific pursuit um, and that isn't enough either but it's much easier than they're making it out to be you don't have to know everything about the Cambrian explosion in order to justify that there, that existence is a sing singular sentient being you just need logic and and humility I guess and like uh, and uh, discipline to think about it long enough and honestly enough and that's it and um, yeah, but it's not what you know these people are not doing that but uh, it's 
it's tough once you do do that though to justify going to school to get a phd and some things and you know i think about this all the time it's like should i go back to school and get a phd in physics or philosophy or something and for the sake of even this project and part of me understands why that would be a good idea but also part of me feels like it's just feeding a system and also it would like if people are only take paying attention to what you're stating in your work or your book reading your books or whatever because you have a phd and they're only taking you seriously because of that those aren't the people that i want following my work because they're the people who are definitely going to misinterpret it i want people who are going to understand it and that's why they're following it and um uh so i'm very conflicted about <laughs> accreditations right now but at the same time um I I look at the world of accredited physicists and, and even a lot of philosophers, but much more so physicists. And there are no theists anywhere other than maybe two or three. And uh, that's not a bunch of different theories. There's one theory in physics. It's that consciousness is emergent from unconscious matter. And that the universe does not have an intentional, there's no intentionality to it and no goal to what it's doing and what it's going through. That is the theory in academia, in physics. That's it. There is no other ones. And um, I mean, there's some outside of academia, but they're outside of academia. And uh, so this is... You know, the, 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 the crisis in physics, and this is the problem with every single field, it's not even just in that there... It's that it's in also the fact that... It's not that there is a crisis. It's that there is a... There is an inability to even perceive that there is a crisis. And if you listen to Sean Carroll, you're like, yeah, you are really smart. And you are actually very logically consistent within the framework that you are assuming and that's true he is very good thinker i will admit but he's also starting from very he's just starting from a foundation of nothing and um uh it's just wrong foundation and but the thing is is that he can't even perceive what different ideas even means because you would need to know how many different ideas there would really need to be in order for us to actually like realize what's going on. There's two degrees of freedom always. If both were represented and taken seriously, that would be one thing, but that's not the case. And it's almost impossible because theism and the idea that sentience is fundamental, like I said, it's not just a physics theory. It's a theory of everything and everyone more fundamentally than everything. It's the theory of everyone. And um, and this means that in order to take something seriously, you literally have to disregard everything that you n know about everything or that you think you know about everything. If you're a theist, you have to disregard all these things that you assume in every field, in every aspect of your life in order to take seriously, you know, um, emergent materialism, I guess and or anti-theism and in order to take theism seriously if you're an anti-theist or you're an emergent materialist in a way then you have to disregard everything that you, you have to assume for the sake of argument all these things that are go against your your worldview that extends way beyond just your you know your physics projects this is a crisis guys it's actually a crisis it's not not a crisis. If you listen to Sean Carroll and you're like, oh yeah, actually he's right. There really are just institutional, you know, egos, as Eric Weinstein uh, puts it, the embedded growth obligation. There really is just biases that form naturally over time, and that's true. Sean Carroll says there's no cabal or conspiracy. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's not true. Um, uh, I'm not saying he's part of it, but I'm just saying it could be true. And, um, uh, and it also could um, 
it, it is also definitely the case that there is just closed mindedness. But there's also this really fundamental issue, which is it is about the fundamental nature of reality, which is exactly what physics claims to want to study, but it doesn't actually. Like it's this, like I said, it's the study of how. It's not the study of what or or why or who. And what if in order to understand the the where and the when and the and the what um which is or the the where and the when and the how which is physics you need to understand the why and the who uh and what was the last one and the what like that's and and that makes sense right and so but you can't if because you assume there isn't a what or because you're just assuming it matter okay but what is matter it's matter what do you mean what is it it's energy well, what is energy well, uh, i don't know um okay well you're assuming there is no who and you're if you assume there is no who then you assume there is no why and if there is no who then there's no why and then there's also no what because you can't understand what the what is without us, the assumption of the who. And this is why it's so limited. And this is the crisis. And even if you're not a theist, it would be humble, the extraordinarily humble thing to do would be to just assume for the sake of argument that these that these ideas should be taken seriously and and maybe you try yourself or maybe you just in i don't know in some ways you you lend a hand to theist physicists or something like that i don't know what that means i don't know what that looks like maybe that's not the right move and maybe we just need to make a new institution i have i don't know but i will say that um uh it, the hum that we should Try and be as humble as possible, all of us. And I understand what it's like to be an anti-theist or a self-described atheist. I was my, almost my entire life. So um, I'm not ripping on anyone or judging anyone. But this is the cause of the, of the crisis in physics. And there's lots of reasons why we have this disparity between theists and anti-theists in academia, in, the, in certain sciences especially. But... Uh, they don't really they they don't matter that much right now in terms of just describing what the problem is they if you want to figure out how to avoid the problem in the future then yeah you can try and figure out exactly why this has emerged but uh and there's multiple reasons why it has emerged there's lots of reasons why this has emerged um and part of it is just the way that we educate people um and it's it's just prioritizing Second-hand information above first-hand information, that is a huge problem. But uh, that has consequences in everything. Physics, you know? It, it, it dictates who gets accredited for and taken seriously and why, and also uh, it ends up... It, it, like, you're not going to think sentience is the fundamental... Na nature of it or defining nature of existence if you are not prioritizing first-hand information of course if you prioritize first-hand information you must assume sentience is fundamental because it is fundamental to your everything your experience your logic your life your your definition of of existence itself if i say you Think about yourself not existing anymore. It's like, okay, you're not sentient. <laughs> you know? That's what it means to not exist. And um, from a first-hand perspective. But we don't think about that like that. We think about it as like, oh, if I, you know, if I paint a painting and then I, you know, I don't know, erase it, then that doesn't exist. And it's like, now you're doing the your your the problem is you're still sentient being 
deciding whether or not that thing exists or not. Like, it's still dependent upon a sentient being. It's, it is. Um, and we'll, we'll, you, we will sit there and we'll like logically be like, okay, but what if I wasn't here? But you can't not be there in if you're in order to think about it. Like in order to think about it, you are, you're there. You don't even have to be there in the room. There's and so it kind of tricks us into thinking that we can think about in a situation in which like something exists, but there's no one there to see it. Like when a you know does a, if a bear shits in the wood, no one is there to see it. Did it happen or whatever? It's like, yeah, the bear saw it. <laughs> like it definitely happened, but uh, I don't know if that's a good metaphor or if that's even the correct one. I know it's a tree falls in the woods or whatever, but. Um, uh, but there is no instance in which anything happens in the universe which nobody do, nobody sees it. That's the thing. That doesn't exist. But you can't get there and even to even understand why that would be the case without certain um, without assuming sentience is fundamental. So that is the crisis, guys. It's a huge crisis. There's only one physics theory. That's it. String theory and loop quantum, these are not different. They're detail different. That's it. It's like, um, it's like a car with three wheels versus a car with four wheels. We're really, we're letting people travel. If you can only travel by car, but you can travel in a car with three wheels or a car with four wheels, maybe even a car with two wheels. It's like, this is, we're allowing all these different ideas. It's like, no, what if I want to take a helicopter? You know, that's a different idea, not another car or another wheel thing on wheels like that is we're not thinking about this properly. We don't even know what it means to have a diversity of ideas. There's only two ideas. That's it. The rest is the details. But you get the details are after we've already chosen a path and like you can't choose a path if there isn't a choice and there is no choice in physics right now um, really not in acad academia uh, another interesting thing here that um, uh, he he stated is he talks there's two more clips I want to show this is him talking about infinity and um, yes, but anyway I used to talk a lot more about infinity and we probably should start talking about it again because it's just so misunderstood. It's not beyond you at all. The, the straightforward mathematical worry is that you just can't calculate anything, even in principle, because it's infinity divided by infinity. Uh, that's the um, argument that people like Paul Steinhardt put forward, saying that the current version of eternal inflation should not be taken seriously as a scientific hypothesis. Now, that's a tricky one, because that there you have to say, well, maybe. <laughs> You know, the thing about infinity divided by infinity is sometimes it's just completely ill-defined. If you just say those words, you can't actually pinpoint what the answer is. But in practice, for specific examples of infinity minus infinity, maybe there is a perfectly unique, well-defined procedure for turning that into a well-defined number, right? I don't know what he's getting at exactly with this. He talks about it a a few times and um it might have just gone over my head and how in what he's trying to relate it to it might be something in physics that um but when i first started this if you go back and you watch my very first second video that i ever put out on on this channel where i introduced my work it was before it was even called sentient singularity theory i just wanted to contribute to this conversation i had no like idea no need to push my own theory and um but I talk, I open it with like a discussion about infinity and one. And, and I'm not going to say that I didn't, that I wouldn't change some ways in which I said things back then, because that was the first time I had spoken publicly about this project. My ability to define things at this point is much more developed than it was then, um, because I had not spoken to anybody about this stuff ever before this. And, um, uh, that was the first time. So while my models are basically the same uh, as they were in that, uh, my my language 
is very different than it was. Uh, but I talk about infinity there. And first of all, what is infinity? Infinity is, if it is anything real, it is starting from one and then going up in quantity uh, endlessly forever. That's what infinity means. It's one and, and above, it grow, growing, not as a static thing. It's a dynamic structure. It's not a static number that is static. That's why we get so confused by infinity. As we sit there, we're like, well, can we even conceptualize infinity? And then we try and think about it. We try and think about it as a, a static quantity that is endless, which is impossible. But if you think about it as a dynamic growth process of starting from one and going up, that makes perfect sense. In a fundamental sense, that is infinity. You, do, you can't go backwards in fun, fundamentally. You can only start, and you can't start at zero it, fundamentally. You only start at one. Fundamental metamathematics starts at one, goes up. That's it. There is no negative numbers in metamathematics. There is no, or metaphysics, there is no zero in metamathematics or metaphysics. Um, but uh, infinity, if you think about it, what is infinity divided by infinity? It's the same as anything divided by itself. One. That's it. Anything divided by itself is one. And infinity divided by infinity is one. That's the answer. It's very, very, it's super simple math. It's not even simple. It's so simple that it's beyond the normal rules of mathematics to some degree. And there's a point in this, what he was stating, he was talking about, and it might have been a mistake, he said infinity minus infinity once. He said infinity divided by infinity multiple times, but then at some point, he it seemed like a slip up. He said infinity minus infinity. I don't know if that was intentional. That is a much harder question to, to answer. I still think the answer is actually one. Which, but that's that means that the, that's very odd because that is a different rule set. Um, that that's really different than like you would think that that would mean zero, because you're, if you follow the rest of the rules of math. But I think that the actual answer of infinity minus infinity um, is one. It's not. It's not zero. It can't be zero. And because of what the nature of infinity is. And, um, uh, but we don't, we don't, we don't have the context of infinity because we don't assume sentience. And when you don't assume sentience, then you don't assume starting from a single sentient being that is dividing itself. And when you do that, then you realize that you have to start with one. You cannot start with zero. But if you don't assume sentience, then you try and start with, ze with zero. And that's what throws you off. And so, um, but infinity is starting from one, going up endlessly. That's it. And um, uh, and this is when I say like you can't go infinitely backwards. Infinity minus infinity, you get to one, and because um, that's as far back as you can go. And uh, in a fu like fundamentally, when we're talking about fundamental quantized existence, we're not talking about relativistic, you know, um, uh, effective mathematics that's a tool in any situation that you want to try and apply it. I'm talking about like fundamental, a mathematical fundamental description of reality as infinity. It starts with one, goes up. And uh, it's just interesting that infinity divided by infinity is obviously one. It's obviously one because it can't not be one. But infinity minus infinity is the hard one, and because it does require a rule change. It's not because it's you need to be so smart to think about it, but it's because you need the context in order to think about it, in because because you realize that the rules don't work. And um, uh, the traditional rules don't work of mathematics in that circumstance. So, but I'm almost positive. The, the And I don't know what use this is, but I'm just saying it's interesting. Um, 
and it was Sean Carroll's probable screw up to say minus instead of divided um, that caused me to think about this but I think that infinity minus infinity the answer is one and that's pretty cool but infinity divided by infinity is obviously one it's very simple why that is the case um, but if you think about infinity as infinite negative numbers and infinite positive numbers and inclusive of zero on a number line and all these other numbers that could potentially be that you know I don't know aren't just natural numbers then infinity divided by infinity makes no sense it's ill-defined is what uh, Sean Carroll said it's like yeah because you you didn't define infinity and you because you couldn't you can't define infinity in any circumstance other than the circumstance in which I just stated. It is the only circumstance in which infinity is able to be defined because it's, and it's the only circumstance in which infinity is, is real. Every other instance of infinity that you would call infinity would be ill-defined, meaning wrong. That's why you can't get an answer. It's because you're wrong about the definition of infinity. Um, and I thought uh, that's just fascinating um, but uh, and it, it's interesting that zero is the un in a natural number you know in the number line but with negative numbers and positive numbers na zero is kind of the joiner of them and it's kind of like I don't know like I visualize it as some type of loop and it's a single loop though it's like uh, infinite oneness which is kind of what you know, that shape is, like my wedding ring, represents infinity. You know, endlessness, a ring. A wedding ring represents en endlessness. But it also represents unity. And, um, but, uh, but zero doesn't exist as an empty set in a, in a metaphysical context. So, because of that, infinity minus infinity is probably one. Infinity divided by infinity is definitely one. Um, oh, SO10 is a physics theory. I think it was a, a grand unification theory. SO10 physics. SO10. Uh, grand unit. Yeah, it is. It's a gut. Grand unified theory. SO10. I've looked into it. It actually looks probably not really false, but. At least from a specific perspective, there's a lot of quantities and symmetries that I see that similar to my work. Um, but um, he talks a bit about the measurement problem, and I am. It doesn't matter to get into it too much. You probably heard me talk about this before. There's no problem in the measurement problem. Uh, waves and where you're seeing a point on a wave that's it like because the constraints of focus of your own mind that's what it's the, because of the constraints of focus itself like it's you will see a point and then they call it a particle there is no measurement problem um that the problem is that the assumption that it's a problem um but you need philosophers with a theolo likely with a theological worldview in order to come in and be able to help answer these questions. Uh, that doesn't mean that I have the equations for them, but that does mean that I can probably help guide the equations for them if there are equations for them. Um, and that is the job of a philosopher. You're not supposed to be doing the math. Like, that's not my job. But um, not in all cases. Uh, He talks about how every academic institution has dogma problems, which I get, and I, you know, good for him for at least admitting that, but I'm not surprised that he does admit that. Um, and, uh, and then he takes a specific jab at Eric Weinstein, and, um, uh, and so we'll watch that first, and then we'll watch the final clip. This is very much as probably a specific Slow. Jab, at, jab at Eric Weinstein, which is why I included Eric Weinstein on, on the cover of this um, is because Eric had a theory for the, that was I think related to the Yang Mills equations or something like that and uh, he 
or the, I know I forgot which ones it was. Maybe it was that one, but so Wh no, it was Witten, I think, and um, uh, and he had proposed it to his professor at some point and uh, as an idea, and then his professor shot it down, and then years later he watched Ed Witten basically present um, these equations that were very similar to Eric's, and Eric has told this story. And, um, you know, Sean Carroll takes kind of a dig at that, but not a dig, but he just mentions it without mentioning Eric's name. But that's why I included Eric on the thumbnail. In progress in fundamental physics, we, we, we've come up with several wonderful ideas, but it's nowhere near the pace it was 100 years ago, right? You just got to face that. That's a fact. And in that situation where progress is slower than it was before, that's the time to roll the dice a little bit, to take some chances. Uh, everyone, every older theoretical physicist has a story about how when they were younger, they had a cool idea and they went to their mentors or their senior people and said, here's my cool idea. And they were told why the cool idea wouldn't work. And they said, oh, okay, I didn't know that. You're right. You're very wise and very smart. And then five years later, someone else actually wrote the cool, cool idea and figured out how to make it work. Okay. Everyone has that story. I certainly do. It's so easy in physics to say why an idea won't work. It is harder to say, yeah, you know, I think it won't work, but let's pursue it anyway. Let's see. Let's like, you know. Um, Alan Guth, when he wrote his first paper on inflationary cosmology, had a model which clearly didn't work. And he publishes the paper and says, look, I know this doesn't work, but maybe someone will fix it. And of course, someone did, and it went forward. That's a hard thing to do. I, I hope that we can become better at that. I'm I would love for Sean Carroll to be able to do that with, with the assumption of theism in physics, and just for the sake of argument. And um, like I said, if he ever watches this, I forgive you for blocking me on Twitter. <laughs> And um, uh, I, I, I would love to see his conversation with someone who is a theist in physics. I can think of maybe two that I would be interested in seeing. And, um, and, and I, I, you know, when, when he saw my clip, uh, I'm sure I think he saw it on Instagram um, because uh, it had had a hashtag with his name. Um, when I had shared it a long time ago. And uh, and then I went to try and see his Instagram once and it was blocked. So I blocked on Instagram and Twitter. And I, and, um, I, I hope that we don't do that to, the, to theism and physics. Like that is, that's the opposite of what he's claiming here. And, um, and I know that, I, I, I think he'd probably say that that's different. And, um, and I know that I'm not a physicist with accreditations or anything like that, but like, it doesn't matter, you know, I, I don't know why I would have been blocked if it wasn't, if he didn't think that the logic was threatening, to be honest. Um, but, because it wasn't like I was spamming anyone, I don't do that. Um, but, uh, or being cruel or harassing, or I just don't. I do not do that, and um, uh, or I try really hard not to these days. I when you know, five years ago I had not as good manners online, but now pretty good, and but I would hope that we can do that with the theism and physics. Is that people who are not theists can be who are anti-theists, which I don't say that as a negative. I just say that as a fact like Sean Carroll, can be like, yeah, I don't think theism is a good idea, but let's entertain it a bit. And I've seen him do it, you know, he had on the, the, the biologists to talk about evolution, and they always talk about evolution, and it's stupid. It's not the thing to talk about. It's because you're trying to refute the idea that you're like a, you know, like a coloring book creationist or something. Like, and that's not what we should be focusing on. We need to focus on physics. Where are the theist, the physics, physicists who are theists or the people with physics ideas or philosophical ideas that are related to physics that are theists? Those are the discussions that need to be had. And um, uh, not, not these discussions about timelines and evolution and, you know, Cambrian explosions. It's just not helpful. But, um, uh, anyways, last clip. I understand, though, what he's saying with in regards to Eric's story. 
And, um, you know, I believe Eric's story and, I, and nobody's disputing that. But like, I also understand Sean Carroll's perspective is that, you know, this happens to me a lot, though, too. And, and sometimes it's, you know, people came up with the ideas before me, but I didn't know. And then I'll, I'll be like, oh, I've never heard anybody say this. And then all of a sudden I'll see somebody say it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, that sucks. And granted, it was much more, you know, it, it, it's different if it's people who you know. And, um, and it's not that I don't think Eric Weinstein was claiming that Ed Witten stole his equations. I think he was just basically stay, saying that there were people in the room that knew that he, that Eric had come up with an idea like that a long time ago and had been, it had been, you know, uh, shunned and that, that did not speak out and be like, oh yeah, this is like actually what. Eric had just uh, proposed. And I would have been pissed too if that happened to me, just being honest. But at the same time, um, you know, people come up with similar ideas. Uh, the truth, if there is a truth, it means that we can reach it, not just one person, but, you know, lots of people. Well, and, um, uh, that is a frustrating thing sometimes, but it's also a good thing. It's an important thing to your ideas becoming adopted. And uh, you actually want people to come to similar conclusions as you, so you can eventually be like, okay, let's work together. Let's grow this idea. Um, it's You're not going to be the single sole person that converts everyone. You're going to have a few people have similar ideas, or they're going to be drawn to you because they have similar ideas um, at first, and then it grows. But... Um, yeah, I mean it's there's nobody right or wrong in this like clip uh, where it's where it's what it's related to. It's just wanted to share it because that's it, it. It's pretty obvious. It's Eric that sparked Sean Carroll's desire to make this stream, and it's um, especially with that uh, clip, and um, that's why I included Eric on the thumbnail. And like I said, I have huge respect for both of them. Um, this is not a ripping on anyone. So, last clip. People voting for party B, every single state or every single county or whatever elects a representative from party A. You don't get 10% of party B in parliament, okay? The same kind of thing is happening when you hire theoretical physicists. So as a field, it would be nice if we could give more representation, I think, to alternative ideas. I would completely agree with that critique of the field as a whole. In my mind, when, I have, when I'm talking about alternative ideas now, I'm not talking about people wandering in off the street with their theory of everything. I'm talking about people who have come up, you know, understand all of modern physics very, very well, have done the work, have made a clear and conscientious and just decision that a particular minority approach is the best way forward and are doing their best, right, within that tradition. I, I, I do think that we have a failure of creating a mechanism for supporting and nurturing those kind of alternative ideas. And I think that's a shame. And some people, by the way, just don't want to <laughs> have any support for alternative ideas. They think that they more or less know the right way forward. Uh, you know, I, I started the thought experiment by saying, you know, imagine that you're perfectly rational and, and you distribute your credences. A lot of people distribute their credences 99.9% .9 on one thing and 0.01% on everything else. So that also makes it hard. Uh, but what I'm trying to get across is there are a bunch of structural reasons why physics departments tend to be conservative. And they conservative in the sense that they're going to hire people who are working in the areas that are sort of the sure things rather than the gambles. And the same thing goes for funding agencies and prize committees and so forth. Uh, academia in general, not just physics departments. There's a lot of structural reasons why things are conservative. And I do think that's a problem. I mean, you even see it in institutions like the Perimeter Institute, which is one of the world's greatest physics institutes right now. But when it started out, it was much quirkier. <laughs> you know, Lee Smolin was there and Fotini Marco Pulu and a bunch of people, and they were doing loop quantum gravity and weird approaches to the foundations of quantum mechanics. And as it grew, it became more respectable. They, they turned into one of the world's great physics institutions, as I said, but they also became much more just mainstream and ordinary. It's a part of the life cycle of a physics department or institute. You have a plucky band of rebels and they kind of equilibrate and they become more normal and traditional. And you can't blame them. You can't blame that particular institute because they're just trying to 
be a good physics institute, right? And, and their little part that they play turns out overall to make it harder and harder for small idiosyncratic research programs to flourish. You know, there are people who have tenure, you know, or senior people, and they can work on their own quirky little ideas, right? That's part of the idea of tenure is that you're supposed to be shielded from the pressure to conform to everybody else's standards. But guess what? In a physics context, which is the one I'm familiar with, two things happen. Number one, you would like to have funding. You would like to get a grant uh, to pay your summer salary, to pay your travel expenses, to pay for your new computer, to pay for your graduate students and postdocs. And it's harder to get that grant. I, I know because not, not from applying for grants, but from being on the grant giving out committees. The grant giving out committees that I've been on are, I mean, if you had you been on them, you would actually be really impressed by how hard people try to do the right thing. Like, it's kind of like you, so you hear stories about juries um, that go along the same directions. Like there's always terrible counter examples, but really people take their responsibilities pretty seriously and they do want to support young people. They want to support uh, daring ideas, etc. But it's just easier to give support to the things that are kind of sure things, right? Or at least the most likely thing to pay off in the eyes of the rest of the community. So that's one thing that happens. And the other thing that happens is, and this absolutely happens to me, like you might have as a senior person, some quirky ideas that you think are interesting and fun, but the mainstream doesn't really uh, agree with your attitude on, but you need students and you have students, whether you need them or not, they come to you as graduate students and would like to work on projects. And those students need to get jobs. You might be a senior person, you might be fine in your job, but they're at the beginning of their career. And you can tell them, and I do, if you do this kind of thing, it might be fun and exciting, but it'll be hard to get a job doing it. And then they can make a educated decision about what to do. But oftentimes what they very, very sensibly want to do is, you know, please let me work on things that will, will allow me to be continually employed as a physicist, okay? When you're a graduate student, that's not the time to take these giant risks, unless you're the singular genius, in which case, good for you. but for most of us, you gotta be able to work in ways that other people recognize the value of your contribution. And that's, you know, it's not, again, it's not evil, right? It's not, it's not people trying to stamp down dissent or anything. It's just, if I'm hiring postdocs, I'm gonna wanna hire someone who I can work with. That's not irrational or unreasonable. So if someone has their new weird take on things that I have just no interest in, it's very unlikely that since I, you know, rarely get to hire postdocs at all, that I'm going to spend my rare postdoc position on someone who I'm not going to be able to work with, right? Okay, so basically that's the last clip. And uh, everything you said there is perfectly legitimate. I say that as the weird person who's wandering in with their own theory of everything. And, um, uh, but I also it will state that I don't think that this is a physics problem either, so I don't have to be a physicist. Like this is, there is no, this is what people don't understand. There is no credentials. There are no credentials. There is no degree. There are no credentials that qualify you as an expert on fundamental theories. There's, it's non-existent. It's not physics. That's what people don't understand, but they're assuming it's physics. And so if you don't have a physics degree, then they don't take you seriously. But what I'm seeing is that the people who are actually making the most progress on this stuff is people who are like physics, they're learning some physics because they have to, but they're, you know, computer scientists or philosophers or, uh, or they are, um, you know, neuroscientists even or something like that, psychologists, like people like that. And that's because of this, all that's much more tied to information and even sentience. Um, and those people are actually working on a fundamental theory or unified field theory. And, um, but I will say that like physicists should not be blocking people, you know, if you don't block someone just because you came across some video that happened to, uh, you know, be logically threatening uh, regarding theism or something like that. Like that's it, you. Theism is the it is the quirky idea, but it's also the logical idea. I would say, even if I understand Sean Carroll would not, and um, uh, but it's it is the idea that must be entertained. Like it's. There are only two degrees of freedom. Does the universe have an intention? Does it not? 
And if it doesn't, then yeah, there's tons of quirky ideas we could guess. But that's not, those are all details. Okay? String theory, if, if string theory and geometric unity have the same take on fundamental existence, the nature of fundamental existence, and one of them, and neither one implies that we're inside of a mind, which I don't think is the case. I think one of them does imply that we're inside a mind. Uh, or, or not string theory, um, like many worlds, and like, I don't know, geometric unity or something. Then, like, those are two different ideas. But if they're both implying, if they have the same implications about the fundamental nature of existence, then they're just details. Like, that's, like, what is physics? It's about what is existence, right? But it's not. It's about how is existence in its current pursuit. But they claim that it's about what is existence. But then they don't actually attempt to solve that problem. They don't even know that they're not attempting to solve that problem. And that is the, that is the crisis. There is absolutely a crisis in physics. It is not just due to a lack of representation, even though that is a that is a response. That is a, it's kind of an inevitability anyways, positive and negative. But it's also a byproduct um, of the real crisis. And, uh, but there is a crisis and it's not, why is everybody a string theorist? The real crisis is, can, why does everybody assume that, have to assume and to be taken seriously as a physics, um, you know, as a metaphysics or physics idea, that this is not, that this has nothing to do with intentions or, or sentience or consciousness or anything like that. You, you know, and we talk about it constantly in every physics discussion, people bring up consciousness because you can't avoid it. But, um, but the fact that it keeps coming up and it hasn't changed the narrative um, shows you just how much of a crisis we are actually in. Like we are every single physicist that is claiming that consciousness has nothing to do with physics and nothing to do with quantum mechanics. And like they are literally ignoring their own existence in that circumstance. That is an absolute crisis. It is a crisis in not only, you know, physics, but it, or not even just all the implications that transcend into the fields above it, but it is also a crisis in just people's ability to think in general. And uh, that is a big problem. Like that is a crisis. And so I, I disagree with Sean Carroll that there is no crisis. You know, once I was in a, I, I was witness to this discussion between Eric Weinstein and a bunch of math students, PhD math students and physics students. And he was trying to talk to them and about some certain things. And he was like, he was not making headway and I could see it too. And he was like, I, I think everyone has malware in their minds or mo almost everyone. And he's like, and I don't know how to get you to see it. And I saw it, I mean, the whole time, like I understand exactly what he's just getting at. And, and he, he gets at this a lot when he's talking about, you know, when people ask a question that is a bad question because it implies uh, an A or B answer, but maybe the answer is both A and B at the same time. And, uh, but then that's not an option. So therefore it's a bad question and that we're asking the wrong questions and that this is kind of a symptom. Uh, I'm assuming that he needs that this, he would, he would agree that this is a symptom of, of this ma mental malware that we currently have. And um, it is absolutely mental malware. And the, the mental malware is the prioritization of secondhand information above firsthand information about, about fundamental existence. That is the malware. And it is due to the schools for the most part. And there's lots of reasons why that's the case, but can just state that it is very much largely due to different realities involved with our current school system. And it's not about what we're taught. It's about how. 
So when people say things like, I'm going to send my kid to private school, I'm going to send my kid to this school, they have a bad school system, they have a good school system, none of that matters. It's all about how you're taught, not what you're taught. Are you allowed to learn or are you, uh, are you um, restricted in your ability to learn? But, but because you are just forced to memorize constantly and uh, out, out of context. Like that is, when you go and you learn your math equations and your Pythagorean theorems and all these other things in school that you never then touch ever again, and um, that is, that's a problem. Like, and we need to fix that kind of thing if, if we're gonna fix this on a, or help, really help this on a systemic level. But, uh, but it is, a, it is fundamentally this mental malware is the prioritization of secondhand information above firsthand information. And it leads to antitheism or the, the assumption that sentience emerges and is not the defining attribute of existence or the defining characteristic of existence, which is a denial of your own existence. It's illogical, even if it's wrong. It's what somebody said to me over the week, last week when they were talking to me. They were like, but what if the universe is not sentient and it's just you? And I'm like, that's very, it seems to be very unlikely and logic seems to point the other way. But even if that is true, it's illogical to assume that is the case because of the fact that it's contrary to what you, to what the logic seems to imply in multiple arguments, but also to your fundamental experience, which is what you should value above anything else, even above your own logic. You know, you can be like, well, logically, it seems that this is inevitable. It's like, yeah, I can do that too. And But if you're starting from the wrong premise, then you're going to end up in the wrong um, situ conclusion, even with that, even if you are logical, but you're logical starting from the wrong premise, so you're going to end up in the wrong place. But you still can't deny that you it seem to know that sentience is the defining attribute of existence and there's no logic that you need to like try and extrapolate from in order to get there other than just feeling of your own being which is constant so uh there is a crisis, like I said. Sean Carroll is wrong. There, he's right about everything he said. They are not. That's not a crisis. But he, everything he said that he, tonight is when he's like, this is not a crisis. This is not a crisis. This is not necessarily a crisis. He's right about all those things. But he's doesn't. He's not aware of the the real crisis, which is worse than than what it would have been uh, if if given you know his definitions of what would be a crisis. But I will say it's still a great stream to listen to, even though it's four hours and he doesn't actually get the right answer. But um, uh, he doesn't identify the right problem is really the reason why he doesn't get the right answer. Yeah, it's not just that he doesn't get it. It's that he does not... The, the problems that he puts forward as the potential... as the situations that would be the potential crises in physics, if there was a crisis, are not the actual crises. If there was a crisis, they are. They are just details of you know various things. There are there is a crisis, and it's not in anything that he stated. But I, he said a lot of things that I like, and um, he goes through an entire history of physics. He gives so much information. It's highly um, informative, and I recommend subscribing to his YouTube channel and uh, even watching that stream. It is linked below. I will check on any final questions. Uh, please ask them in the chat. Don't forget to hit the like button. It helps fuel the algorithm, and then I will get out of here. Um, How to Hunt is a big, big is a great Bigfoot channel to watch. I believe you, but I'm not interested right now. Right now, logic, discipline, and perspicacity. Not saying it because Andrew Tan. Perspicacity. I don't know what you're what that means. 
perspicacity. I don't know. Um, Andrew Tate popularized the term. I don't listen to Andrew Tate enough to know. So, but I'm gonna look it up because it sounds interesting. From where you could also get when and whether. Um, I don't understand you can have numbers without zero though. Without the concept of zero, you can't describe a number system or at least you'd be using it and taking it for granted without realizing it. That's not true at all. Why would you need zero? There, There is no need for zero. You might need it in the, in the relativistic, you know, effective mathematics that we use as a tool, but when we're talking about the mathematics of, a, of the structure of fundamental existence, there is no such thing as zero. There can't be. Maybe you could say there's the concept of zero, but uh, but that it, it doesn't even matter. It, but there isn't, though. That's the thing. I don't even think that that is an accurate way of thinking about it. Um, there, there is the concept of only, but only is one. Not la it's not lacking. It's not it's not an empty set to say only. There is a concept of only. In if that make I don't know if that makes any sense, but if you're God and you're the only one and you're thinking about whether or not there's anyone else, you don't need to think about oh there. What if there was no one else? Because there can't be no one else. If if just by the nature of an enclosed system, which is existence itself by definition, having information being self-referencing, therefore sentience would be an inevitable thing in that system. You you can't even have that not exist. It's the only way to be, and um, and so you can you can in order to have the concept of lacking, it's a lacking of others, but lacking of others is to say only, and to say only is to mean one. It doesn't mean not nothing or no one. It means when you, if God's sitting there and he's like, there's no one else, which he was aware of, that isn't zero. It's more that it's, it's not, you don't have to have the concept initially of there's no one else because it's built on the assumption of your own existence. And so you say no one else it's not that there's no one, it's that there's no one else. And that changes it from zero to one. So you, another way of thinking about it is God, to, be, to realize there was no one else, he could also say, I'm the only one there is. And that is one, it's not zero. You don't have to, and you start from one and you build up and you know, partition, divide to multiply infinitely. And um, that's not, there's no zero. There's never been a fundamental zero as an empty set. Now, if you're gonna define zero as the superposition between infinite, infinity and one, then sure. But it's, if you're gonna define it as an empty set, the way that we traditionally think of as zero, which is a, a lacking, an absence, there is no um, fundamental zero. It's only one. And there's no fundamental negatives. There's only positive numbers. Because you're talking about objective quantities. Um, you're not talking about conceptual, like, movements alone. Like, you're talking about quant, like, existent quantities. You can, there is subtraction, but it's actually, but subtraction and addition are one action from two different perspectives in fundamental mathematics, just like division and multiplication are one action from two different perspectives. So if you say, how does a cell multiply? It divides itself. So it divides itself to multiply. That is one action from two different perspectives. If you're the cell, then you're dividing yourself. If you are, or if your focus is on the, the initial cell, if your focus is on you know, what comes after, it's multiplication. But same thing with, um, uh, addition and subtraction, you know, if you're starting from one plate and uh, of cake, one cake, and you need to put cake on another plate, then you have to subtract in order to add cake to that plate that has no cake on it, then from, you have to subtract from the one cake to add to the other cake. Or 
subtract cake from one plate to add it to the other plate. So now you have two plates with cake, but they're, they're, is, they're the same action, subtraction to add, dividing to multiply. These are two different actions, um, but they're actually, even then, uh, they're still actually one action. It's like the four perspectives of one action is to add, multiply, uh, and uh, divide and subtract at the same time. When a cell divides, it's it's subtracting from itself to add to a new cell, and um, uh, so it's the, it's it's just two perspectives of two perspectives of one action, which is exactly the four primary perspectives of sentient singularity theory: inside, outside, separate, and oneness. Um, they are, correspond to these four primary mathematical actions, or but they're not really primary mathematical actions. They're, or they're like operations, primary operations. It's like four, and then, and then you can also say that there's six, but there's really four. Um, but it's but even then, it's it's like that four is actually two, and that two is actually one. It's just a matter of what your focus is on. But um, but yeah, it's. It's fascinating. Metamathematics is fascinating. And it's very simple, but you just have to have the right context for it. You have to realize that you're dealing with an actual like singular holonic beings or the um the uh what are the uh they call it the um the monad. You're like starting from the monad and going from there. Mono meaning one. So you start with the monad. You don't start with an absence. Um, so. Uh, 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 you're talking about like using zero as a placeholder symbol in mathematics. That, sure, that, yeah. But that's just a placeholder symbol. That's different um, than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about fundamental metamathematics. There is no fundamental zero or empty set. But, um, but yeah, we use zero as a placeholder in systems of, of symbolic, in our system of symbols that, that we use for mathematics. Shankar alluded to this in Rogan podcast. Um, Carl should have alluded to this in the Rogan podcast. What a fraud. It all goes back to the Newton and Copernicus. Look at the current Oppenheimer film, Pure Propaganda. I don't know what you mean by that. I saw the Oppenheimer film. I don't know what you mean by it's propaganda. Um, I'm sure you know you have an argument, but I don't know what you mean. Um, uh, I promise you he does get it. I, I don't know what you mean. I don't think Sean Carroll gets what he's doing but I also um, think that it's like in, he halfway gets it but it's not it, but he doesn't he doesn't understand the implications of it if that's what you're getting at you don't deny theism because you know the truth and you really know it and you you just don't want it to be you know spread most of the time, most people are not like that. They 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 don't see they see the logic they don't see the logic in it according to their own like immature perspective of what God would be, and um, because they stopped going to theological, they they stopped their theological education or understanding or pursuits um, or learning at like twelve, and so they've they have like a twelve year old understanding of theism and. Um, I was this, I, you know, I, I thought it was so stupid. And uh, I was like, my, my rabbi here after I had a theophany was like, I was like, yeah, I think it's actually logical that the, we're inside a sentient being, which means God. And he was like, I was like, I used to think this. And he was like, yeah, well, you know, all these people stop their theological learning at, and investigation at like 10, 12 years old. 
so then they have this 10 or 12 year old viewpoint of what theism is and um, you know that happens to people and uh, that's a lot of adults with when it comes to thinking about God um, Uh, love alternative thinkers like you why there are so few people watching you keep going uh, thank you I appreciate it I don't know uh, I think because my streams are so long that's why I have so few viewers but I appreciate everybody in the chat always please share this with anybody you think would find it interesting but um, we will be doing more produced videos uh, throughout the year uh, and um, I have some planned that should help bring the numbers up but that's not the goal of this um, project either is to get a bunch of viewers but uh, I will admit that l people t participating in the chat does give me drive but likes does not but it does fuel the algorithm so please hit the like button um, that's not what I meant um, uh, mm, do you need a zero uh, okay I think I'm gonna call it but thank you guys for watching uh, please uh, hit the bell notification if you haven't, if you'd like to participate in our uh, weekly open calls on our Discord and join the Discord community. It is a very uh, good and, and um, you know, fun community. I really enjoy everybody there. Uh, it's uh, just send me a private message on Instagram and ask me for the link to the Discord and I will give it to you. My website is below. My Patreon is below. Uh, and... Uh, like I said, please share this and hit the like button. With that, everyone, peace.